Hello everyone. My name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. This video is a 3 hour long shell scripting tutorial which is designed to help beginners learn shell commands, shell scripting and also prepare for the interviews. This video tutorial consists of three parts wherein first part you will learn basics of shell scripting or i can even say absolute basics of shell scripting because even if you haven't written a single shell command in your life you can still go ahead and start with the part 1 because we will learn basic shell commands that are used by system administrators devops engineers and we will also learn the relation between different shell commands that is how one shell command can be used in combination with the other shell command so that you can also start your journey from shell commands to shell scripting so this is about part 1 then in part 2 we will increase the level a bit and we will learn little advanced shell commands where the commands that you have used in part 1 the basics of shell commands will help you in part 2 so in part 2 we will not only learn little advanced shell commands but we will also learn how to write your very first shell scripting so in the very first shell script we will learn how to write metadata for the shell script what are the building blocks of a shell script we will learn how to use best practices while writing the shell scripting and we will write a shell script for node resource monitoring so this is about part 2 then in part 3 we will focus on the interview questions whatever the concepts that you have learned in part 1 and part 2 we will learn how the questions can be asked on these concepts and how you can present yourself explaining answers to this question during the interview so this is a three part video tutorial and try to cover from part 1 even if you know the basics of shell scripting you can use part 1 as your revision material and play it at 2x or 3x speed so now without any further delay let's get started with part 1 okay so without wasting any time now let's start with the basics and try to understand what is shell scripting at all okay so what is automation in your uh, thought process okay so automation is a process where you will try to reduce your manual activities right let's say you are given a manual activity so now to reduce this manual activity you choose to automate this one this is common in any field right this has nothing to do with devops or software so even in your day to day activities if you are doing something constantly and something that is very tedious or something that requires a lot of your effort you will try to do automation so similarly if you are doing any such thing on your linux hosted machine or on your linux compute whether it can be a linux machine on your aws right or a linux machine that you install on your laptop i mean if you take a laptop and if you install linux software that becomes a uh, linux virtual machine you can use a virtualization software or you can use oracle virtual box and you can create a virtual vm now what what are the kind of things that we can automate on a linux machine so let's take a very simple example somebody asks ask me okay says abhishek write numbers from 1 to 10 so what i'll simply do i'll use the echo command i'll print the numbers from 1 to 10 now you might say that this is okay this is very simple and i have done it without any automation or without uh, requirement of any shell scripting now what if this number increases from 10 to 1000 still okay so i can spend more time and i can increase this numbers from 10 to 1000 i can keep writing now what if i increase the zeros so i keep on adding more zeros so now it is technically impossible so in such cases or let's say somebody asks you to create okay uh, 100 files on your 
Linux machine. What are files? Files are very similar to your Windows. So on Windows, you create a notepad or on Windows, you create a uh, MP3 file or MP4 file. Similarly, in Linux also, you can create those files. You can create zip files. You can create tar files. So somebody came to me and said that Abhishek, create 100 files. So I'll use one of the uh, Linux commands probably called as touch. Uh, let's for example, so touch is a command which creates files, which we'll look into it. So what I'll do is I'll use the touch command to create 100 files. So somebody says that, okay, not 100, 2000. So I'll take more time and further if they keep increasing this count. So this is why you need automation or this is why you need shell scripting. So this is a very basic or very simple example for you to understand what is shell scripting in Linux. So shell scripting in Linux is a process of automating your day to day activities or regular activities on your Linux computer. And like I, like I mentioned, this can be anywhere. So irrespective of your AWS hosted Linux virtual machine or your laptop Linux virtual machine, as far as you are using the sh same shell. So in your shell scripting, you can define uh, which shell to execute this uh, script, which I'll show you. So this can be executed anywhere. Okay. So this is what we are going to learn today. So this is the reason or this is the one of the... Uh, how do I say like why do you require shell scripting is an example that I just stated now so what I'll what we'll try to do is we will try to learn how how to write a shell script okay now that we understood what is shell scripting now we need to start writing a shell script first of all so once you start writing a shell script or what are the basic requirements so like any programming language whether you're learning Java whether you're using whether you're learning C so Whenever you submit a set of actions, okay, so let's quickly jump onto the terminal and let's start looking from here. So uh, this is my Linux machine. So I'm currently using a Mac, Mac laptop, so I don't have to install anything. But if you're on Windows, so what you need to do before this video, you need to create an account uh, with AWS or any cloud platform and uh, or you can also use Oracle VirtualBox and install a virtual machine. But to make it easy, uh, you can go to AWS, create a virtual machine, and you can start uh, following this demo. So first of all, to write a shell script, what is the basic thing that requires is you need to have a file. So inside your file, you write a script. So how do you create file in uh, on a Linux machine? So one of the basic commands that works on any uh, Linux machine is touch. So you can say touch, and uh, probably let's say this is, OK, first. shell script okay because i'm writing a shell script the extension would be dot sh similar to uh, if you're writing a python file it would be dot py if you're writing java file so or, i mean depending upon the program language you use the extension so this is how you create a file on your linux machine now as soon as i do it now how do i list the files so list the files is nothing but if you're using a windows machine you can simply go to any specific folder like you have c drive you have d drive what you will do you will you will use your cursor you will use your mouse and uh, you will go to the c drive and you will click on the button on the c drive and it shows all the folders that are present or all the files that are present inside your drive similarly in linux you cannot do all of those things if you don't have your uh, you know uh, prompt or if you don't have, uh, I mean, if you're simply using the command line, the command that used here is ls. So as you do ls, so this is the file that I just created. First shell script dot sh. So this shows all the files. Now, if I want to look the files with timestamp, okay, so which file is created first and which file is created next, I can simply say ls minus ltr. And it shows the files that is created, who created the file, when did they create, what are the permissions, which group they belongs to. Now I'll explain about each and everything uh, in detail, but for now you understood what is ls and what is ls minus ltr. Now you can ask me that I just remember the command called ls, which is used to list the files, but I don't know the extension that to use that is minus ltr. Okay. Or you might say that, okay, I know the ls command, but I totally forgot what and why this command is used. So simply Linux provides you an option which is very good called man. Man is nothing but manual. So just suffix any command with man and simply type the command. So it gives you the details of the command. Like it can be any command. Previously we used the touch command. So I can suffix touch with man and once I enter, press enter, 
it provides the details of this command. So what does it say? Touch. Change file access and modification times. So description. Touch utility sets the modification and access times of the files. If any file does not exist, it is created with default permissions. Okay. So what does it say? If you're using the touch command and if the file does not exist, it is created with the default permissions. That's what it describes. So similarly, if I use the ls and if I want to look at all the options that are provided by the ls command, like I just used minus ltr. So what is minus T stands for? If I simply type minus T here. Okay. So here it describes about the options for minus T. Similarly, you can look at all the options that are available for this command. Okay. For any command. So what is the thing that we use here? We simply suffix it with the man command. So till now we just learned about three commands. Okay. So that's how your Linux is. So within a matter of one minute, we learned three commands already. What are the commands that we learned? First command that we learned is ls. Okay. What is ls used for? ls is used for listing the files or folders, right? Files or folders. Or simply, if you want to list a directory, then you simply use the ls command. And I also showed you how to create a file that is using the touch command. Right. And we also learned about the another new command that is man command. What is man command? Man command is used as a manual for any command that you want to reference. So how do you use the man command? Simply suffix suffix is use man in front of the command that you want to use simply like man ls or man touch or any other commands that we are going to learn. So if you are forgetting something or if you just know the command, but you are not sure what this command is used for. What is your go to option? The manual command that is present on your Linux machine. So any Linux machines will have this basic commands. OK, so these are installed by default, right? So I'm, I have not installed any of these things by default. Whenever you have a Linux machine which comes with shell, so they have all of these uh, binaries or all of these commands pre installed on the Linux machine. OK, so perfect. Now we just learned about the three commands. Now let me open the file. Okay, so what I've done, I've used the touch command to create the file. I've used the ls command to verify that the file is created. But what I want actually is to write a shell script in this file. So to write a shell script in this file, I have to open the file, right? So similarly, if you're on Windows and uh, you, somebody asks you to write a notepad, probably you create a notepad to list some of the items that you want to reference in the future. So what you will do, you will right click and you will create a file using the new file option and then you open the file in a notepad and you start writing. Similarly, you can also use the Vim command. So Vim or VI. So Vim is not available by default. You have to install it, but VI is directly available on any platform. So if you're using any Linux machine, VI is by default available. So you can directly use VI. So now I'll use the VI and I'll open the file that I just created. So now you might say that, okay, there are hundreds of files here. So what you will do simply use LS command. If you don't remember the file name that you created, double click, which will save the file name. So Linux uh, is kind of different. So you don't have to right click and uh, use the copy option that you use on Windows. If you simply double click on any of the content, it gets automatically copied and you can directly use command V or control V depending upon your operating system and that gets pasted on your terminal. Okay, so if people are not aware how I'm using this terminal, what is this terminal? So it's very easy. Uh, you have multiple terminal options. So all that you need to do is go to your browser and uh, let's say you're on Windows. Come here and uh, say download putty. So putty is one of the terminal which provides you the graphical user interface. Okay, so using putty you can basically SSH to your uh, virtual machine and you can start using the terminal uh, that, that I'm kind of using. I'm basically using uh, a tool called terminal. The name is also terminal or item that is I term that is provided by Mac. Okay, so now without wasting time. Now let me open this file. What is the command to open the file vi and if you want a good uh, user uh, friendly interface, then I can use Vim. So Vim is also it's not difficult to download. I'll show you how to download Vim as well. But uh, if you don't have Vim, don't worry, you can directly use VI. So now the file is open. So what is the command to open the file? You can simply use Vim. 
Now let's say what happens if I don't use the touch command and if I directly use the vim command. Okay, so let me call vim second shell script dot sh. So any guesses what happens here? Okay, as soon as I press enter, so the file is automatically created. It says this is a new file and you can start writing on this file. Okay, so even you can basically create a file using vim command, but what is the point of using the touch command? So you might ask me, okay, if touch and vim are using the same thing and vim has advantage over touch or VA has advantage over touch, that is you can create the file and you can write the file at the same time, then why should I use the touch command? So you might get this question, but touch command is basically used in your automations. So it is very important to learn the touch command. And if it is very important to remember the touch command, because whenever you are doing automations, you cannot use the Vim command because Vim is basically used to write inside a file. But whenever you whenever you are doing some automations, like you might have you have you might have a requirement to create thousand files, okay, for some random reason. Let's forget about the reason. But somebody comes to you and says, "Abhishek, create thousand files." Now you cannot create. No, you cannot use Vim inside your script because Vim opens the file. Okay, it creates and also opens the file. What happens if the file is open? Let's say uh, you have a Windows laptop and uh, I'll play thousand movies at once. What happens? Your machine gets crashed. Okay, similarly, even in Linux, you cannot open a lot of files. And if if a lot of files are open, then it's a problem. Or uh, what happens if a movie is opened and left like that? And uh, if you try to close that process, Windows says that, okay, this process is used by somebody else. First close that file and then only you can close this process, right? Let's say you're watching a movie and you want to close the uh, mp3 mp3 or mp4 player that you are using so what when you try to close the mp4 player what your window says okay you cannot close the mp4 player because somebody is using the mp4 player similarly you cannot keep a lot of files open okay so that is why we also use the touch command so now let me open this one so i'll just double click and using the vim or vi i'll open this file and now to start writing the shell script the very first thing that you do is use this specific indentation or use the specific syntax slash okay uh, hashtag followed by exclamatory followed by slash so this is called shebang so what is this called this is called shebang so what is the use case of shebang i'll explain and then followed by you will say slash bin slash bash or slash sh or slash ksh what are these things okay so now this is something very important to learn. So before I start writing a shell script, first of all, I need to explain you what is this first line that everybody writes in a shell script. So now you go randomly to any shell script. Okay. So let's say I will go to a GitHub. Okay. GitHub shell script examples. Okay. And uh, I'll randomly open any GitHub repository. So I just opened a GitHub repository here and let me increase the font for you. And uh, let me open this script folder. And there is a simple shell script here called addition.sh. And what is the first line that this person wrote? Shebang user bin env bash. So everybody uses the shebang and writes the specific syntax or effect.sh. Randomly, you open any of these files. Okay. So the first line would be using the shebang and the shell that they are using. Now, what is the requirement? Why you have to do that? Okay. So let me explain you this with a detailed, uh, I mean, what is the history of writing these things? So let me explain. you. Okay. So you are seeing my board right now. Let me erase all this content here. Uh, my bad. What is happening? Yeah. So why would somebody write a shebang inside every shell script? Okay. So what is the purpose of writing shebang followed by slash bin followed by any specific thing here? So somebody is using bash somebody is using dash somebody is using sh somebody is using ksh what are these things okay so basically if you follow the history of linux so these are the different executables of your shell script okay so a linux machine depending upon kind of the linux machine that you are using these are the different executables so whenever you are writing a shell script and you are executing the shell script somebody has to take your action right so let's say you are running a java 
Java file or you are running a Java program. Who is executing this Java program? Who is executing this Python program? Similarly, there has to be an executable who is executing this shell script as well. So these are the executables. What are they? If I have to repeat one more time, there are there is bash, there is ksh, there is sh, and similarly there is also something called as tash dash. So these are the different options. There are other options as well. If you are using ax, there is different things. So I'm not going into details of it, but these are some of the most used things. So these are the different options that are available. So you have to specify, you have to inform your Linux or your kernel that, okay, so this is the executable that I want to use for executing my shell script. So what is the difference between each of them? So each of them have their own uh, syntax differences. So there is, there is not a much difference. So there is not a drastic difference between bash and ksh and uh, dsh. So more or less the kind of shell script that you're writing or the kind of commands that you're writing is similar, but they vary slightly in terms of syntax. So be very careful on what you want to use. What? So now you might ask, okay, Abhishek, don't confuse. What is the thing that I have to use? So one of the popularly used or one of the most widely used is bash. Okay, so bash is something that is most widely used. So instead of learning all of them, because there is kind of syntax difference, for example, the way you write a shell uh, for loop in bash and the way you write a shell, uh, for loop in ksh is totally different. Okay, so uh, bash provides you more easy way of writing a for loop. Whereas with ksh, it is slightly different and because it is obsolete, you don't have to learn it. What is obsolete mean? Like nobody is using it or very less people are using ksh. So what is the most commonly used is bash. Now, one more thing that you find here is if you uh, look at your program, uh, like if you look at the uh, shell script that are written in your organization, or if you randomly look at shell script uh, that are used, uh, that are provided in the GitHub, so you widely see opinion between these two things. So most of the people are writing shebang followed by slash bin slash sh, and some other people are using shebang slash bin slash bash so what is the difference between them what is the difference between sh and bash now previously i explained you what is the difference between ksh bash and uh, also the other things like dash or dash but what is the reason why people are using slash sh also for using the bash scripting even though people are using bash scripting they sometimes use sh so previously okay if you if you again go back to the history of linux so slash bin slash sh is something that redirects your like even though they are providing slash bin slash sh so there is a concept in uh, linux uh, called linking so there is soft link and hard link which we will not cover in this video but there is a option uh, option called linking so using linking even if you are providing this one this previously it was redirecting to slash bin slash bash that means so even though you are providing this the request is taken by sh but it is forwarded to bash okay so it is using the concept of linking okay so don't worry if you see sh or bsh in your previous scripts the scripts that were written uh, previously in your organization so uh, if you see slash bin slash sh and uh, if you think that it is executing bash, that is because of the linking concept that is provided. But, but, but these days, like over a couple of years, I can say, or like just uh, previously in a year, what happened is some of the operating systems like Ubuntu, they have started using, I mean, they have started linking dash uh, slash bin slash sh to slash bin slash dash so instead of bash they started using dash as the default now why they are using it is out of scope of this video but you have to understand that now you cannot use this syntax so you have to be very careful if you are writing a bash scripting always use slash bin slash bash okay so do not complicate the script or if you uh, like you know if you start writing this one your script might might not work in some cases like uh, in a ubuntu machine like you share your shell script uh, you write a bash scripting and you share your shell scripting to one of your colleagues and uh, inside their machine slash bin slash sh if by default it has set a link to slash bin 
slash dash your script will not work okay so that's why you have to be very careful so always the linking for slash bin slash sh is not pointed to slash bin slash bash so previously it was happening but now some operating systems have decided that they want to use dash by default and not bash by default so be careful whenever you are writing a new shell script always use the proper syntax that is slash bin slash bash so this is your interview question as well so what is the difference between slash bin slash bash and what is uh, sorry slash bin slash sh and slash bin slash bash so if somebody is asking what is the difference you have to clearly explain that okay previously both of them were same because slash bin slash sh was redirecting using the linking concept to slash bin slash bash but now it is not the same because some of the operating systems have decided to use dash as default so your ship your script might not execute if you are writing in bash scripting uh, on a machine where dash is default okay now we have discussed a lot about these uh, the difference and we totally understood what is the first line here that is slash bin slash bash because we are writing, because we are learning bash scripting we will always use the same first line now i'll try to keep the script very simple and the purpose of this script is to just print my name now how do i print my name so the requirement is you have to write a shell script what that shell script has to do is whenever somebody is executing this shell script it has to print my name is abhishek so every time people can't write right every time uh, like you say 100 people have to write this thing so you are given an automation that write a small shell script that will enter i mean whenever you execute that shell script it has to print my name is abhishek so to print something if you are on windows what you will do is you will simply uh, go to your keyboard and you will start writing saying that my name is abhishek but on linux it is different whenever you are using the shell scripting there is a command called echo using echo or echo what you will do is you will write my name is abhishek so if you are using java you might be using print statement right similarly in shell scripting we use the echo statement that's it now let me save this file now how do i save this file so this is one of the challenges that a fresh or a new uh, linux users might face so if you are very new to linux first of all you have to get used to the linux environment so how do you open a file how do you close a file like i told you to open a file i just used vim command but let's say i just opened this file okay let me go back and uh, i use the uh, vim command and i just open this file by default if i enter my keyboard okay so the first thing that i have to do is come to the insert mode okay if you see here i'm i'm in the insert mode what is this thing why is it so complicated complicated so okay so if you are using a linux machine or a linux environment so there are set of things that you have to follow that once you open this file the linux has to know that what what is the purpose of opening this file are you trying to read this file are you trying to write inside this file or you are trying to do like just copy some content from this file and paste it somewhere so for that purpose you have to inform that i just want to open this file and write something so for that you have to use the escape button and press the i okay once you press i it says that okay now you are in the insert mode so what i have to do so whenever i'm opening a file i just have to open the file press escape and click on i so once you click on i so it goes to the insert mode how do you know if you are insert mode so to your left bottom you will see something called insert so you are now in the insert mode now once i am insert mode i can start writing like the one that i just wrote slash bin slash bash okay so i now wrote Uh, i just wrote something into this uh, shell script and now i want to save this file to save this file again you have to press escape okay followed by colon you just have to give the colon and if you see here carefully notice what i'm doing here then press wq wq is for saving the file and followed by the exclamatory mark and then press enter so now your file is saved with this content what happens if i don't do all of those things you are whatever you wrote onto the file will not be saved okay so let's say now uh, i also have one more file here right so second so i just open this one let's go to the escape and press insert mode and now i'll start writing something here slash bin slash bash and i'll say echo i'll just say hi 
okay instead of escape colon wq what i'll just say is just q okay and i'll press the exclamation mark what happens here is if i reopen this file there will be nothing inside this file now why there is nothing because i did not use wq but i used q q is just like quit so you are not writing anything inside the file and you are just quitting the file so if you want to save the file what you have to do you have to use colon wq exclamation mark so this is the thing so this is how you save a file so we learned how to open a file we learned how to write a file and we also learned how to save a file so these are the different things now you wrote this file what is inside this file let me again see so every time i can't use the vim command and always close it right so there has to be easy option so every time i open this file i have to press escape colon q close i don't want to do all of these things so simply i just want to copy this file name and i want to look at the contents of the file okay so for that we can use the cat command what is cat command cat command is used to print the content of the file did you see so now i don't have to open the file and close the file i can simply without opening and closing the file print the contents of the file so that is the purpose of using cat command okay so we also learned about the cat command now how do i execute this script okay now i spoke a lot of things like open the file close the file without opening the file print the file but i want to see how to execute the file itself so for that what i have to do is either i can say sh sh for uh, you can simply suffix with sh and enter your file name okay i can also do this or i can simply use dot slash okay so two options so dot slash can be used to execute any file whether you have a python script also you can use dot slash basically whenever you have an executable uh, so shell script this is an executable file right you can execute this file so any executable file in linux can be executed using dot slash if i don't want to use dot slash and if i want to definitely mention it as a shell script so i can simply say sh followed by this thing okay so two options either use sh as suffix suffix or either use dot slash as a suffix whatever you would like to so as soon as i pred, uh, enter this one this has to be executed but it says permission denied okay so this is one other new concept that you will learn in linux okay so what happens in linux is let me go back and explain you here okay so in linux although you are the creator of the file okay you just created the file but linux terminal want to understand whenever you create a shell script or any file linux terminal wants to understand okay who who can execute this file okay you just created the file you wrote something in the file but linux the main purpose is security okay so linux is very very secure so as soon as you open a file you write something in the file okay you create this file what linux says is as soon as you save this file and you try to execute this file using dot slash or sh linux says okay wait now before i execute this one i need to know who can execute or it asks who are you do you have permissions only if you have permissions i can allow you to execute this file so for that whenever you create a file you have to grant permissions to your file so this is a new concept that you are learning and this concept is not straight forward because in linux granting permissions is not straight forward okay on windows machine even in windows you can do it like you know you can right click and you can say who which user has access which group has access but like in like i mentioned you most of your linux machines does not have a gra graphical user interface okay you cannot uh, directly use your cursor or something because you are when you are working on an organization you don't install a gui on all of your machines so for that what you will do is you will only use the command line and using command line the command that we are using here is watch carefully this command so this command is not complicated but you need to understand the details of this command okay ch mod so ch mod is the command that grants permissions grants permissions to a file okay now what is this command i'll explain you in a very simple terms just divide this into two parts one is ch 
and one is mod okay so ch stands for change so what you are basically doing is you are changing the permissions of a specific file using the ch mod command okay so just use ch mod followed by any file name and it should change the permissions of the file but what are the permissions so you have to provide the permissions right so in linux you cannot write saying that like you know uh, ch mod provide write permissions to this file so that is how not that is not how you will do so linux has a specific mechanism okay so what are the three things that are required for the ch mod command i'll explain you in a very simple terms okay so ch mod first you understood what is ch mod command right now we will try to learn about the arguments that you will pass to a ch mod command so ch mod command basically like i mentioned you it provides permissions okay so what it is divided into three categories so the first category is which user has access which group has access to a file and what are your permissions okay so the first is what uh, sorry here not this is not which user what are the permissions for a root user okay so root user is a super user in linux uh, i'll explain you what is a root, root user but first category is what are the permissions for the administrator user second is what are the permissions for the group third is what are the permissions for you okay so these are how the three categories are divided because a administrator should have access to a file a group should have access to a file and personally you should also have a access to your file because you are the creator of the file or you are the one who is using this file so by default if i log in i'll be the user uh, i am trying to access this file so the last one defines what is your permissions which group and firstly the administrator okay so this is how you define permissions for a specific file now so this is for the all users what is the permissions for all user what is the permissions for your group and this one what is the permissions for you so this is how you define and in linux what you will do is you will try to categorize this one okay so using the numbers so using numbers you will actually grant permissions for the file so how do you do that so by default if you want to grant access to everybody you can simply say chmod777 followed by the name of the file so now if i try to use the file gets executed and it printed whatever you wrote in the shell script okay so now chmod command if you try to learn about this file you can simply use man chmod there is lot of information that is provided but in a simple terms if you want to learn about chmod like i mentioned you ch mod grants you access for three different things what is the permissions for all users what is the permission for your group what is the permissions for you so these are the three different things that ch mod grants so now how do you define you define using the number terminology okay so what is the number that i just used and how this number is categorized okay so 7 is your magic number okay so if you see carefully i granted 777 so i said 7 for myself 7 for my group and 7 for everyone so literally everybody is logging to this machine has the number 7 as the access permission granted uh, my group also has 7 and myself i also have 7 now what is this 777 so linux basically used a formula called 4 2 1 what is 4 what is 2 what is 1 okay so 4 is for read 2 is for write 1 is for execute okay so you can basically provide your permissions using this let's say i will say that one file uh, like i'll use this command chmod 444 xyz xyz is the file name okay so here the permissions that i have granted is 444 what is 444 read 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 so indirectly i am specifying that okay uh, we will try to uh, write very carefully here so that everybody will understand okay so like i mentioned user group everyone 
so here user means owner group means owner who is the owner whoever has created the file okay so by default i can create a file and i can also not give permissions to myself and group is the group of the owner of this file everybody is literally everybody who is logging into this file so whenever i am using chmod 444 xyz is the name of the file what happens is like i mentioned you the formula is 7 what does 7 mean 4 2 1 what is 4 4 stands for read 2 stands for write 1 stands for execute Okay, now using this formula, if I'm saying 444, four, four, that means read, read, read. So as a user, as the owner of the file, you will also get read permissions. As a group, you will also, get, I mean, the entire group, your group will get read permissions and everybody will also get read permissions. So that means nobody can actually write this file. So for example, let me do that. CHMOD 444 four, four, push shell script file. Now I change the permissions of this file to 444. Now let me try to edit this file. Okay. So because we just learned that 444 will only give you read access. And if I start writing something and let me save this file, let's see what happens. Okay. Let me open this file. Oh, sorry. What did I mess up here? Sorry, just give me a second here. I think I... Okay, so now if I uh, try to execute this file using the same command uh, followed by, I mean, dot slash, and if I execute, it says permission denied. Okay, this is because I changed the permissions of the file. So if I do it back like chmod 777, first shell script dot sh, now let me try to use the command one more time. Okay, so now it got executed. Okay, however, it said that there is a syntax error in the file, but the file got executed. So that is the purpose of using the chmod command. Okay, so now let us take a pause and see what are the commands that we have learned. Okay, now that we have learned a lot of commands, we need to just summarize what are the different commands that we learned. So now Linux provides you a very good option that is called history. So history is a, another command. If you click, uh, if you just type history and press enter, it will show you all the commands that you have entered. So let's say you forgot uh, a specific command that you are using on your uh, production machine, like a regular command that you use or a regular shell script that you use. So you can simply use the history command to see what are the different commands that are entered. So these are the different things that we have learned till now. Okay, now let's take a pause and let's try to summarize what are the different things that we learned. Okay. So let me wipe this up. So isn't uh, shell scripting losing, uh, looking simple? Like what is the only thing that you need to do is you have to practice these things every day. Okay, as long as uh, you don't practice, then it is very difficult to learn. So now let's start with it. Firstly, what is the command that we started with or the basic command that we looked at? The first command that we looked at is how to open a file. So for opening a file, there are two things. Firstly, you have to create a file. So either you can create a file using touch command. Okay. Or directly you can create and open file using Vim command. So now what is difference between touch and Vim? So touch will only create the command, whereas Vim will create and also open. So what is the advantage of using touch? So touch is basically used in automations. So whenever you want to create hundreds or thousands files, you cannot use the Vim command because it creates and also opens. So that's why there are two different commands. Now, I don't want to open the file, but I want to read the contents of the file. So in such cases, you can use the cat command. So cat command can be used to print the contents of the file. Again, what is the command to list all the files in the directory? You can use the ls command. So ls stands for list. So you can use, the, you can list all the files or all the folders in a directory using list command. So for that, you use the ls command. And after that, what is the another command that we learned? We learned about the chmod. What does chmod do? chmod provides you the permissions. Or if you want to grant permissions to any file, you can use chmod. And after that, we also learned about the man command. So what is man command? Man is basically a manual command. So if you suffix any command using man, that will show you the details of the command. Like you can simply say man ls. So what happens is it will provide you the details of the ls command, all the documentation for the ls command. And we also learned about 
other comments what is the other comment that we learnt am i missing something here okay so we also learnt how to write inside a shell script right or how to write inside a file like for that you also you to like you cannot simply go to the vim and uh, it keeps on writing right so for that firstly you have to use the escape button and using escape you have to press i once you press escape press i so that it goes to the insert mode once it goes to the insert mode you can start writing inside the file and after that if you want to save the file you can simply use colon wq which will save the file or if you want to simply quit the file and not do anything you can simply use colon q so these are the different things that we also learned so these are the very basic commands okay so using this basic commands now you have the capability of creating the files reading the files you can list the files on to your uh, what are the files that are pro that are available on your system okay so now let's look at the history if we missed anything right any other command that we learned and we forgot to discuss here okay that pretty much uh, pretty much seems to be all the commands that we executed and all the commands that we learned now let's learn about a new command so if you are on a windows okay how you will understand that which folder you are on okay so you can simply use your cursor to understand which folder you are on but in linux like i said we most of the times use the command line interface so for listing the current working directory or the present working directory in which directory you are you can simply use the pwd command okay so pwd says that okay this is your path so in this path you are currently in and uh, that's how you identify what is your present working directory so let's say you want to go one directory inside uh, a specific directory okay so you can use pwd to understand in which folder you are and once you identify which folder you can go to different folders so what is the other command that we learned just now that is pwd so pwd is very simple and straightforward command so now i explained you how to create files but i also want to explain you how to create folders okay so creation of files and folders in in windows machine is same just right click and uh, it creates a file or using new folder you can also create a folder like you can use new file or new folder but here in linux we have one more command that is called mkdir so using mkdir which is make directory mkdir stands for make directory just say mkdir my first folder okay now i want to see if the folder is created or not like i mentioned you ls command minus ltr will list what are the different files and folders with timestamp so if you see what is the latest thing my first folder so i created the my first folder now i want to go inside this folder okay so i am currently in the shell scripting tutorials folder but now i want to go to my first folder so like if you compare to windows again you double click on this specific folder and you go inside the folder but in linux you use the cd command so cd is change directory so using change directory you can go to the any directory that you want okay now if you see the folder got changed from shell scripting tutorial it got changed to my first folder if you don't have this user representation how you identify which folder you are in you can simply use the pwd so here pwd says that i am currently in my first folder okay if i go back using cd dot dot and i use pwd now it says that okay you are in the shell scripting tutorials folder so that's how you understand using the pwd and using cd you switch the directory or change the directory and using mkdir you create a directory okay so now let's go back and summarize what are the different commands here apart from this commands i just explained you about three different commands first is pwd what is pwd pwd is to identify the present working directory where you are correctly on your linux machine your linux machine have hundreds and lakhs or thousands of folders but you want to do currently where you are so for that you use the pwd command you can also use this commands in the shell scripting so that's why i am talking about all of these commands so pwd is used to identify the present working directory okay so talked about all of these things i want to create a folder so for that i use the mkdir command so mkdir is used to make a directory or create a directory once i create directories i can go into the folders or directories using the cd command what does cd stands for c stands for change d stands for directory so using cd you can change any directory okay so within matter of uh, some 30 minutes we learned about 10 commands okay so 
it is very 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 easy just that you need to have a hands on and can you can keep continue i mean you can continue learning different commands or you can continue learning shell scripting in linux okay so we now we learned about different like 10 different commands now let's try to put all of these things or most of these things and write a simple shell script okay so i'll not complicate this one if i do ls let me go back to, let me go to the uh, my first folder Okay, and inside this folder, if I do ls one more time, there is nothing here. Okay, now I'll simply write a shell script to create a folder, to create a file. So every time this shell script executes, it has to create a file, it has to create a folder. And inside this file, you know, we'll also change the permissions of this file. And finally, you know, we'll see if the uh, everything got executed or not using the shell script. So as usual, we'll use the vim command to write the shell script and also open the shell script because our purpose now is not just to use the touch command because if i'm using the touch command here i have to use two commands one is to create and other is to open the file so here i'll use the vim command and i'll say sample shell script dot sh okay and inside this file what i'll do is as usually i'll start writing using shebang followed by slash bin followed by slash bash and now I'll write here the first thing. Okay. Now, whenever you're writing a shell script, it is always a good practice to write comments, not just shell script, but any, any, any programming language, you have to write comments because it, you only, you should not understand what you're writing, but any person who does not know the programming or if they want to glance through your script at a time, like, you know, they cannot read the script in detail, like they are in a hurry and they just want to look at the shell script and understand what you have wrote. So for such things, you just write a simple comment. So how do you write comments in shell script? Use the hashtag. So hashtag references comments. So whenever you write something followed by hashtag, this line is ignored. So shell script will not execute this command. Who is the shell script? So this bash Whenever it finds hashtag followed by something, it simply ignores. It understands that, okay, this is a comment. I don't want to execute. So it simply ignores and proceeds this as a comment. So what I'll say here is create a file. What is a command to create a file? I can use simply the touch. And using touch, I'll say uh, first file, for example. And I'll also create second file. Let me create two files. Okay. So create two files just for a, just for an example okay before that what i'll do is i'll create a folder as well okay so create a folder now i'll name this folder as abhishek for example so what is the purpose is i want to go inside this folder using cd abhishek and i want to create two files so this is my shell script that's it so whenever somebody is executing this shell script it has to create a folder called abhishek it has to create uh, it has to go to the folder called abhishek and it has to create two files now let me save this as soon as i save this what is the thing that i have to do i have to give permissions to this okay because even though i am a user i cannot execute this one now we are not much bothered about security so i'll simply say chmod 777 okay so i'm granting complete permissions to myself the owner of the file complete permissions to the group uh, which which is my group i did not create any user group here so if at all i am creating a user group and i'm adding my colleague as a uh, user in my group let's say i'm in development team or devops team so i can add people to devops group and what happens is linux will grant devops everybody in the devops group read write execute access and finally anyone not just me or not just my group, but anybody who is logging to this Linux machine and if they are trying to execute, so I'll say simply seven. So anybody can access this file. Okay, so things are clear till here. Here, I have done is I have just granted permissions to everyone. Sorry, my bad. So chmod seven, sorry, seven, seven, seven. What is the name of the shell script? I totally forgot. So let me just say ls. Okay. Using ls, if ever, if at all I'm forgetting the name of the file or if at all I'm forgetting anything, I can simply say ls to list all the files and folders in this specific directory. Okay. But yeah, I think there was a disturbance in my desktop. So, okay. Now everything seems to be back. So as soon as I press ls, so this is the name of the file. Now I'll say chmod 
seven seven seven. If I don't want to grant permissions to all the other people, I can simply say seven seven zero, so that they cannot read this file, they cannot write this file, they cannot open this file. They can do literally nothing with this file. But if I only want them to grant access and everybody who is logging to this Linux machine, let's say that they only want to execute this. I only want to give them the permissions to execute, not read or not write. They cannot read the script. They cannot write or make any changes to the script, but they can only execute the script. So in that, in such case, I'll give one. One stands for execute. Like I mentioned, the formula is four to one. Four to one is the formula. So four stands for read, two stands for write, and one stands for execute. So if I have to grant all the permissions, four plus two plus one, which is seven. Okay. Sample shell script dot sh. Okay, perfect. Now let me execute this file. Sample shell script dot sh. Let's see what are the things that are happening. Okay, it executed. It did not print anything. Okay, now let me press ls. What happened? This is the script that is there, but it also create a folder called Abhishek. Now let me see what is inside folder Abhishek. So let me go to the folder Abhishek, and let me press enter ls. Okay, it created first file and second file. That is your task and which is accomplished. Okay, so this is how you can simply write a shell script. Is it clear? Is it not so easy? Right. So this is how simply you can write shell scripts. So it is as simple as this thing. So within one hour, now you learned how to write a shell script. What are the different things and uh, what are the like you know uh, what are the how do I put that? So, what are the different components that are involved in writing a shell script? So, the only thing that I would like to summarize here is shell scripting is very, very easy. Oh, okay. So, the screen sharing got skipped. My bad. Okay. So, for some reason, because there was a power cut, the uh, screen sharing got uh, cut. So, let me uh, re explain this thing here. No worries. I can explain this one more time. So what I'll do is I'll go back here and uh, let me go back to the folder called my first folder. Okay. So I think you were able to see my screen till here, but now I'll re-explain whatever I explained. So this is the shell script that we just wrote sample shell script. Let me delete this folder so that you will not be confused. So for deleting, we can simply use RM minus RF. I'll explain about the RM command as well, but now if I ls, this is the file that I just created, which is the shell scripting file. And now what I'll do is I want to execute this file. So let me execute this shell script. As soon as I execute, what happens is the script got executed and it created a folder. Why the folder is created? Because we use the uh, command in the shell script for creating the folder. Okay. So if I open this file one more time to explain you what are the things that I wrote. So firstly, we created a folder using MKDR. So that's why a folder is created. Now, if I go and see inside the folder, there should be two files called first file and second file. Let us see if the files are also there. So CD Abhishek and if I LS, yes, first file, second file, both of them are available. So this is the shell script that we just wrote. Isn't it so simple? It created a folder, it created files. So similarly, whatever the automation that you are doing inside your uh, office. So these are the different kinds of activities that you will get. So this is a very basic script that I wrote, but you can complicate the script. Now, without wasting your time, I'll try to explain what is the role of shell scripting inside a organization. So we will focus mostly about DevOps, right? So because we are talking mostly about DevOps, let me explain you the scope or role of shell scripting inside DevOps. Okay, so I hope you are seeing the right screen. Let me just check if you are seeing the right screen. Yes, I think you are seeing the right screen only. Perfect. Let me erase this one here. Okay, let me refresh the board. Okay, let just me pause this video and see what is going on. Okay, so there was some issue with my screen, but now uh, it seems to be perfect. Okay, so what is the uh, purpose of shell scripting in DevOps? That is what we wanted to discuss, right? So, okay. So let's try to understand this one. So DevOps. Now, as a DevOps engineer, so you have different activities like you have 
infra maintenance right you maintain all the infrastructure of your organization you maintain all the code of your organization using git repositories okay so sometimes you have to interact with git so again to interact with git you use the linux only right like you can ask me that why cannot why can't i do it using windows but most of the organization prefers to use linux because of the security and lightweight nature of linux so you might use linux uh, windows on your laptop but if you are using any virtual machine so it will most probably be a linux machine so you also manage your code using git repositories and that is also mostly on linux and apart from this you also do a lot of configuration management so for all of these purposes on a day to day basis you use shell scripting okay so infrastructure automation is there configuration management and also your code management using git repositories so you can say that there are different tools like ansible that are available here but even though these things are available you have to write some uh, shell scripts for regular automation of cron jobs or you know for uh, switching into the folders where this ansible scripts are available or directly executing uh, that like you know directly log into this machine uh, on a single automation what a user expects is you have to log into a specific machine where ansible automation is present and you have to execute the ansible automation as well or you want to uh, monitor the health of your nodes so let me give you a very simple example so let's say there is a person called a, a devops i mean he is a devops engineer and let's call the name of this person as john so now what is the responsibility of john let's say john so john is working as a devops engineer in or at amazon this is just for an example okay he is working as a devops engineer for amazon and he has noticed that amazon has close to 10000 virtual machines this is just for an example okay or the teams that he is working with has 10000 vms what are vms virtual machines and all of these vms are linux based vms okay now for some reason he has to manage all of this 10000 virtual machines and he has to monitor the node health of all of these virtual machines okay so every time he has to go to these virtual machines and uh, their developers are facing some uh, troubles with this node that they say that okay this virtual machine or any of these virtual machines is not performing as expected they say that the cpu is going out cpu is uh, getting completed or they say that memory is running out or they also mention that you know the linux is uh, becoming very slow or they say that whatever the processes that are running on this virtual machines are uh, basically running slow so every time john uh, goes to these machines and uses the linux commands to fix all of these things what he will instead do is he will make use of shell scripting okay so he will write one simple shell script and he'll save the shell script in a git repository and whenever some devops engineer says that okay there is issue with 9999th vm what he will do is using this shell script he will just execute this shell script on his local machine and what this shell script does is it logs into this one of these uh, he mentioned that 9999 machine is not working so this shell script automatically logs into this machine and it looks into all of these parameters like cpu memory and uh, why are the uh, processes going slow which files are running how many files are opened on this machine so he writes a shell script and this shell script returns an output saying that okay so i executed this script and you know what i noticed is the memory is completely used on one of these nodes okay so it returns whenever he runs the shell script it says it evaluated all these parameters and it says on 9999th machine he said that the memory is going out of place so the memory is completely used or instead of these people raising what john thought is okay okay i'm getting all of these requests like every time i'm getting requests from uh, the developer saying that the memory is completely used so now let me uh, do a simple thing that on a frequent basis like once every day or once every two days he decides to basically execute this script automatically okay so without even his consent this script should get executed and this script should look at all of this 10000 vms okay like i mentioned there are 10000 vms what this script should do is this script should 
log into each of these 10,000 machines, look at the status of each of these 10,000 machines, and it has to send out an email notification saying that, hey John, I evaluated all your 10,000 machines, and out of which 10 machines seems to be suspicious. Okay, 10 machines seems to be suspicious, and in five machines, there is issue with memory, and in five machines, there is issue with CPU. So this is one of the use case for DevOps engineers. So similarly, there are multiple use cases for DevOps engineers with shell scripting and shell scripting is a must learn for DevOps engineers. Okay, like even in the roadmap video. So I made a roadmap video. I think all of you watched that video. So roadmap for DevOps engineer for 2023. So DevOps roadmap shell scripting and Linux is one of the most learns. So if you learn Python, that is even more useful uh, for complicated automations where shell script cannot be executed. So Python is also a good thing to learn, but before to Python, you should definitely learn shell scripting. So this is one of the use case for shell scripting in DevOps engineer's life. So whenever somebody is asking, why are you using DevOps uh, shell scripting? So you can say this example that I just mentioned. You can say that I have automated all the uh, node health of my uh, virtual machines. So we are we have some close to 1000 virtual machines and uh, every time it is difficult to monitor the uh, node health or status of this virtual machine. So I've de decided to write a script. So people might ask you, okay, there are some automated tools why you want to write this shell scripting. So you can say that, you know, uh, in our organization, we are not using such tools or you can simply say that you know uh, these tools are restricted for uh, generating uh, some parameters only a restricted number of parameters but in my script i am fetching more parameters that are not uh, provided by these tools so you can mention in that way so this is a basic use case you can think of uh, multiple use cases like i mentioned infrastructure automation configuration management or the example that i just mentioned or your day to day basis day to day basis activities like you know on your day to day basis you might want to monitor uh, some specific tools and send notifications uh, to email i mean email notifications to you or any any such things you can do with shell scripting okay so now what we what did we do today we learned about what is the reason for shell what is the reason for shell scripting? We learned the difference. We learned an interview question. That is, what is the difference between bin sh and bin bash? So this is something that we learned. And after that, we learned the shell commands. So if you want to write shell scripting, what are the components that are involved? You need to write shell commands. So we looked into different shell commands. We looked into listing files, we looked at creating files, we looked at removing file using RM, we created directories using MKDIR, we deleted directories using RM minus RF. Okay, and we uh, use the man command, we use the present directing directory command, we also used, you know, commands like chmod to grant permissions. Okay, we learned how to write inside a file. So we learned about a lot of things today. Now, finally, I also want to uh, explain you about something like I just mentioned, uh, you know, you can look at the memory inside a machine. So to monitor the node health, like I mentioned, uh, you can write a simple script. So for that, to monitor the node health, you can monitor the CPU as well as RAM. So these are the most important things. Even in your laptop, if you are using overusing your laptop, so sometimes you get error with CPU, sometimes you get error get uh, you get errors with RAM. So how do you find out CPU and how do you find out RAM? So for CPU, there is a command called nproc. So nproc will list the CPUs on your machine, and to understand uh, what is the memory uh, that is present on your laptop, you can use the free command. Okay, so using free command, you can identify what is the free memory, what is the total memory, what is the used memory. Okay, now instead of using all of these things, you can use a specific command or a special command called top. Okay, so using top command, you can basically identify what are the processes that are running on your machine. Okay, so which process is taking more memory, which process is taking less memory. So that's what I'm showing you here now. Okay, so it says total 625 processes are running on my machine. Uh, there are 625 processes out of which five are running, 622 are sleeping. Okay, and it also provides you information about which pre which process is using how much amount of memory, which process is uh, uh, running with which process ID, all the other things like how much CPU is being used, the CPU usage, memory usage, all the other things are provided using the top command. Okay, so what is the command? Top. 
so these are some of the interview questions that people will ask you so how do you monitor the node health you can simply say i can use the top command or i can write the custom shell scripts so what are the different parameters that are used to evaluate the node health some basic parameters are cpu and ram and all the other commands that we learned today i hope you have enjoyed part 1 of this tutorial now it's time for part 2 where we will learn little advanced shell commands and we will also learn how to write our very first shell scripting so today what we will focus is we will try to run a custom node script and this node script will detect the node health of your virtual machine so let's say we will write a shell script we will use this shell script in our uh, we'll try to put it in our git repository and whenever somebody comes to us and says okay abhishek uh, i want to understand what is going wrong on my uh, virtual machine there is something that is not correct so uh, can you please help me out what you will do you will download the script from your google uh, sorry from your github and you will directly execute it and it will send out all the details saying that okay something is su suspicious uh, with respect to the memory or cpu so this is something that we will try to build today for that what we have to do we have to start with writing a shell script so it's called node health dot sh let's say so we will use this script we will try to enhance this script uh, stage by stage so that we understand what are the good practices how do we write shell script in a uh, structured manner and uh, what are some of the uh, practices that we did not learn in our previous video that will help us in writing a better shell script firstly like i mentioned you uh, like i told you in our previous video we start with the shebang always followed by what is the executable that we are trying to use so in our case it is bash and uh, it is a, also an interview question that i mentioned that always make sure uh, you provide the executable that you are executing what happens if you only provide sh then sh will directly go to it is a link to the executable the default executable on your virtual machine in case if it is not bash and it happens to be dash then your script might fail because of some unexpected errors so that's why always make sure you provide the right executable once that is done in the previous class we did not discuss about this but you always have to mention the details of this shell script the details as such who is the author why i am using this hashtags because hashtags are used to create comments so these are not executable shell commands but this is something that provides you the information of the author of the file so i'll say abhishek is the author and when is this file written like this file is written on 1st of december and i'll mention uh, some details like are there any prerequisite for this script or what is the purpose of this script this script executes and i mean this script outputs the node health okay let's say this is the purpose of the script and finally you can also provide details like what is the version of this script let's say this is version v1 and whenever you make any additional changes to this script you can increment the version to v2 or you can also put the script in the github where the version controlling is automatically added okay so these are the details of the author or this is called metadata information so always provide the metadata information because by just looking at the name of the file nobody will understand what is this script file is let's say you'll uh, create a, a shell script called addition.sh but what is this addition is it addition of two numbers addition of three numbers five numbers so such details we always provide in the metadata of the file perfect so now we'll just use the same commands that we talked about so we'll use df minus h for printing the disk space we'll use free minus g for uh, printing the memory we'll use the other command that is nproc for printing the resources let's say we are using these three commands to output what are the different uh, parameters on this virtual machine let's try to execute and let's see what happens okay so i'll provide the, i'll grant the permissions that are required chmod you can use anything i just use uh, 777 because this is just a trivial script and uh, i'll just delete it once this uh, video is done so whenever you create script in your organization make sure you grant the exact permissions okay so now let me execute using dot slash once i execute this notice that it has provided all the information that is required but by looking at this information it is technically impossible to understand what is the output of which command like let's say this command uh, because i know because i already know what i'm doing so i'll understand okay this is the uh, disk space 
this is the output of the memory command this is the output of the number of cpus but to efficiently write this script there are two options okay we'll talk about both the options one option so these are all the good practices that we are learning right so the first option is to use the echo statements so what you can do is before executing your command you can simply say print the disk space or okay so let me complete this and show you what happens if we execute print the memory so now the output will be slightly better print the cpu now let's try to execute and see what happens okay we'll use the same command to output and we'll try to understand the difference now the difference is before printing each and every command's output the echo statement is making sure that the user understands what is the output about so the echo statement says it prints the disk space and this is the output of the disk space echo statement says this is the uh, memory and finally it says this is the cpu details so this isn't it better than the first one definitely yes but 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 we'll try to see what are the other approaches which usually developers follows i mean developers or the uh, devops engineers who are writing the shell script because using echo statements all the times is not feasible like you know in some of the shell script you might have some thousands of commands so if you want to use this uh, echo statement all the times it's not feasible so what people usually do is use this command before beginning of the shell script like before you start writing your shell script what you do is you have to use the set parameter to set this shell script in the debug mode what does minus x stands for debug mode okay so if you use this set minus x all the commands that are executed that gets executed in the debug mode what do i mean by debug mode let's see the output we will understand now if i try to execute this one what happens is before every command output now you see tf minus h so this is the command executed and this is the output free minus g is the command executed and this is the output nproc is the command executed and this is the output isn't it much better than the echo statements because echo statements basically prints whatever you are typing but the set minus x that we have set uh, before the script what it does is it will show you the command that it is executing and it will also print the output so set minus x plus echo statement always use the combination of both of them okay so if you have a very huge script always using echo statements will not help you because you have to write lot and lot of echo statements and when you are writing this echo statements also sometimes you might make mistake i mean you might make mistakes so use set minus x so what did we learn till now we learned about two good practices one is always write the metadata information and then whenever you start writing your script use this parameter to set minus x i mean to set the script in the debug mode so there are some cases where you might not want the user to show what are the commands that are executed so in such cases what you can do is you can remove this set minus x let's say that uh, you are executing some uh, commands which you don't want the user to know so in such cases you can simply come here and you can comment this one out okay so isn't it so easy just set just write one single line and your command will be or your script will be executed in the debug mode perfect now let's go to the next concept and uh, we'll definitely come back to the script like i mentioned you will enhance the script and by enhancing the script we'll learn about more and more things but we will do it step by step so that you will you will understand what that command is and when we try to put that command in the script you will also understand okay so how we are able to write shell script by using these commands now we will learn about a command which will print all the processes in this virtual machine okay now what do i mean by that let's say now you are watching my video so what is the process that is getting executed on your uh, any operating system virtual uh, laptop that you are using let's say you are on windows or you are on uh, mac for example we consider windows so this person who is watching my video he might have opened chrome this is one process and then he might have opened youtube okay uh, i mean and on a different uh, window let's say that he is using youtube application and he has opened chrome for facebook or something and he is watching uh, my youtube video and parallelly he is also looking at facebook so there are two processes that are running and there are some system processes as well what do i mean by system processes let's say uh, you know your operating system has lot of programs inside your c drive right if you ever looked at those processes so these those are called the system processes so at this point of time let's say these are the three processes that are running but 
on a virtual machine there will be a lot and lot of processes that are running if you talk about your organizational virtual machines or let's say you are running java applications on your virtual machine so you are working for a company called amazon okay and in amazon there are 2 to 300 microservices okay so let's say this user has deployed or the developer has deployed 200 microservices and each of this application uses a different process right because they are different virtual machines they are diff uh, sorry they are different applications so each application starts with a different process like youtube has its own process chrome has its own process similarly in amazon let's say you have login application you have logout application you have uh, payments application transactions application so how do you find out what are the processes that are running in windows it is easy you will directly go to your laptop you will look into uh, your you will go to your command prompt or you will go into the search section and find out what are the processes that are running but here in a linux machine which does not have a graphical user interface by which i mean you don't have a user interface to click on the buttons and go and find the processes there is a command to find out this command is called ps minus ef okay or ps hyphen es what does this ps hyphen ef does is ps stands for the processes and hyphen f basically using uh, e it provides the entire details of the process like it provides the details of the processes in a full format so that's why we call it ps hyphen es so you can also just use the ps command but it does not you give you all the processes like uh, there are some processes that are running in the background there are some processes like you know there are some stopped processes demon processes zombie processes so to figure out all the processes what is the command that we use is we use ps space hyphen ef so let's execute you'll see that okay there is a python that is running right in every virtual machine there is python by default so python is running by default and then there are some amazon processes that are running why because we are using an amazon virtual machine and there there is some ss uh, ssh demon process that is running so there are different processes that run in a virtual machine so your task is to not just find out the process but you want to find out the process ids what do i mean by process id so let's say this is the process let's say uh, agent uh, htty or let's say amazon uh, processes are running here so uh, instead of finding out all the processes i just want to find out the process id of amazon only amazon process only okay so your manager comes to you and says abhishek find out the processes that are running by amazon and just get me the process ids so the first step that you will do is you will use ps minus ef you will find out that okay there are these many processes out of which there are two amazon processes that you can see but because this is a long list you might miss some things what you want to make sure is you want to use the i mean make use of scripting so for that there comes a very powerful command that is grep okay so what you do is ps minus ef or ps hyphen ef you'll use grep followed by amazon okay now let's see what happens okay so out of all the processes that are listed now we got only the processes that are running by amazon ignore about this command i'll tell you what this command is uh, i'll tell you what this output is but for now there are only two processes that are running by default by amazon agent so you can simply go back to your manager and share this output saying that oh okay using the ps minus ef command i found out that there are two amazon processes that are running on this virtual machine take the details of it okay so then your manager says no 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 i just want the process ids not the processes that means you know he just wants this numbers why does he want this number because whenever you want to uh, kill the process or you want to take the thread dump of the process you want to take the heap dump of the process you make sure you use the process id okay you want to kill the process you use process id you want to uh, take the thread dump you use process id or anything that you want to do with the process you always use the process id only now before we jump on to how understanding how to fetch the process id from this entire list the first thing that you need to understand is this command okay so what is this command this command is split into two parts the first part is ps minus ef and the second part is grep amazon so we already know what ps minus ef is doing ps minus ef is printing all the information about the processes that are running on this virtual machine and what does this grep command does is out of all the output that is generated it only fetches the information that is required let's say uh, you have 100 lines of code and you only want to get the 
line number 55 and 56 you can use the grep command or let's say you have list of uh, names of employees you only want to get the employee names with sai or harsha so what you can do is you can say let's say uh, there is a command called get me usernames this is not a command uh, don't don't think this is a command so let's say this is a command that gets or this is a script that gets all the usernames what you can do is you can say pipe grep sai so what happens all the people names with sai gets printed like sai krishna or sai hari or whatever it is they get printed so this is the purpose of using the grep command but apart from these two commands there is one more important aspect of this command that is the pipe parameter so you need to understand what is pipe and why is it used so this is one command and grep abhishek is another command or grep amazon is one more command but who is integrating these two commands so that is the pipe parameter so what does the pipe parameter does so pipe parameter sends the output of the first command to the second command got it so let's say you have two commands and you want to send the output of first command to the second command in such cases you use the pipe command make sense so uh, the same the same example if you go back if you have a script and the script is returning a list of numbers let's say one two three four five six and you only want to get uh, the number called five so what you'll do you'll simply say grep five for a, for your better understanding what we can do is we can write some uh, a very basic script called test.sh and in this test.sh what i'll do is i'll say echo 1 echo 11 echo 12 echo 55 echo 99 okay so this is let's say that this is a very simple shell script and what people are expecting here is when you execute this shell script you want to retrieve all the numbers that has one in it let's say one has one 11 has also one 12 also has one but you don't want to print 55 and 99 so in such cases what you can simply do is dot slash test sh which will print all the numbers followed by pipe grep one let's see what happens so it printed you 1 11 12 okay so this is what the power of the pipe command okay so pipe command basically sends the output of the first command to the second command okay isn't it clear perfect now if we try to understand the entire command firstly we use the ps hyphen ef to print all the processes that are running on this virtual machine then we use the pipe statement to print output of this command to send it to the grep command which is trying to grep for the process called amazon perfect so end of the day this command is turning out into a single command using the pipe parameter so the other interesting aspect here is this command i wrote it for your purpose of understanding okay this command can also be executed in this way uh, grep one and the output of test.sh okay so uh, let's say you have output of test.sh and which is printing you something like one uh, sorry one 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 two okay so what does this grep command does is it will try to get the only numbers that has one in it using the same command as well so for your understanding i just use this way but what you can also do is let's say you have uh, a for loop here okay for i in uh, one two hundred and uh, you know you have all the numbers so what you can simply do is you can make use of your okay so i think i am complicating here so we will discuss about this topic afterwards but for now you understood what is the purpose of the pipe command so pipe command sends the output of the first command to the second one very clear so let's summarize what are the different things that we learned till now okay so what are the different things that we learned firstly we learned about the comments to write the file information this is very very important because without metadata information if you share your script with somebody else they will not understand what you wrote followed by we also learned about the set minus x what does this do this will always help you to print your command in the debug mode or print your script in the debug mode then we understood how to find out all the processes that are running on a virtual machine using ps-ef then we learned about the grep command 
which is used to filter the output of any output. I mean, if you have an output and you want to filter some information from the output, you can use the grep command. And finally, we also learned about the pipe statement. Okay. What does the pipe statement is used for? Pipe is used to get the output from the first command and send it to the second command. Perfect. There is an interview question, which I want to bring it here. So people ask you to tell me what is the output of this command. Okay. So from what we learned till now, you will understand that. Okay. Date command. Okay. Let's see what does date print. So date command will print you the today's date and all the information about today. So now if you try to understand here, this is or date is. So what is the expectation here? The date output, which is this one has to be passed to the second command and it should print information like date is something like this, right? Tuesday, December 1st, 12, 8, something like that. But let's see what happens if we execute this command date pipe echo today is. See what happened? It did not print the output of date. So now you should ask me, okay, Abhishek, you said that pipe is used to send the output of first command to the second command, but here it did not work out. So this is one of the interview questions that people usually ask you why, why the pipe did not do what it is expected to do. So the answer is very simple here. So there is a difference between your PS minus EF command or your script. Let's say we executed the test.sh, right? And uh, we try to use the grep command or you can also use the echo command. But the difference here is date is a default command or it's a default shell command. And what it does is it sends the output like the output that you see here. It sends this output to stdin. So in any system, there are two uh, channels, right? Or there are two uh, log flows. One is stdin and then you also have uh, some things like std out or you also have std error. So these are the different uh, channels that every virtual machine has. So what this date command does is it sends the output to std in. Okay. So the input one. Pipe command only receives the information from the output that is typed from this command. But if this command is sending this information to stdin, this command will not work or the pipe does not redirect the output of the first command to the second command. Okay. So this is one of the most asked interview questions. So keep in mind. So whenever somebody is giving you this command and asking you what will be the output, you should simply say that it will only print this because date is a system default command and using this command, what I mean, what this command does is it sends the output to stdin, but pipe will not be able to receive the information from stdin. Pipe can only receive the information if the command is not sending the information to stdin and if the command is ready to pass the information to the next command. Okay, perfect. So I thought I'll explain you one interview question here and uh, we covered it. Perfect. So we'll move to the next one. So for our node health, what we'll try to do is we'll also try to add one more command that we learned. PS hyphen EF, but your requirement here is not just to get PS hyphen EF, but I want to get the Amazon processes. So PS hyphen EF grep Amazon followed by the question that your manager asked is don't give me the entire Amazon information. Only give me the process IDs. So for that, there is one command called awk. You can get it in multiple ways, but one of the most used command is awk. So learn about awk because uh, in the interviews or even in your real life scenarios, uh, while you can get this information with different commands, like you can also use the uh, cut command. People also use the other trim commands and the other things, but always learn about awk because awk is a very powerful command. What awk does is if you go to the man and you say awk, so Awk is nothing but a pattern scanning and processing language. Okay. So if I, if, if I have, I mean, if I don't want to confuse you and if I simply say, so if you want to get some informations, like uh, you want to get uh, only the process ID or whenever there is a string like this here, PS hyphen EF. So this string has different uh, strings, right? So if you consider this as a sentence, this is a string, this is a string and you have other strings as well. So let's say you want to retrieve only a specific column 
uh, or let's say you want to retrieve only the user information or the uh, process information so in such cases you can use the awk command so or what awk does is it can filter out the information from your output so the difference between grep command and the awk command is grep command can directly give you the entire statements or the entire sentences but awk command is very powerful that it can also give you a specific columns from the output so now how do we use this is ps hyphen ef pipe grep amazon followed by pipe awk what awk does is i'll explain you this command okay so there is a delimiter that i'm using that is space followed by i just want to print the second column okay don't worry i'll explain this to you so now see uh, we got the process ids only so how did we do it what is this specific command doing okay so we'll try to understand it in a very simple way so without this awk command what we got we got the entire information now using the awk command what we did is we only try to get the second so let's say this is the entire string and in this string there are uh, sorry this is the entire sentence and in this sentence there are five strings or let's say this is the entire row and in this row there are columns this is column number 1 this is column number 2 this is column number 3 4 5 and so on so my requirement is i just want to get the column number 2 from multiple rows okay so in such purposes you can directly use the awk command which is very 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 easy to retrieve all the columns that you are providing let's say instead of column 2 if i just change it to column 1 what happens it gives the information of the user like root user has started this process root user has started this process ubuntu has started the last process so this is how you can make use of the awk command along with the grep command to retrieve information of a specific column got it let's say now you uh, try to tell me what will be the output of this file uh, this command okay so i'll say my name is abhishek and then there is uh, one more person or let's say my employee id is 111 so this is a file from this file what i want to do is i just want to retrieve the name of the person so in such cases i can simply say grep name followed by the file name okay so what i did is i used the grep command whatever i want to retrieve followed by the name of the file okay so it said that you uh, i mean looking at the file i understood that in this file there is a information about the uh, name of the person employee of the person but you only ask me to get the name so that's why i am giving you the name of the person so grep command is used to get the name of the person but what i can do is i can make use of the awk command here okay and uh, i can say what is the row or what is the column here 1 2 3 4 so i'll simply say print dollar 4 so it prints the name of the person okay so this is how you can use grep in combination with awk so these are really really powerful commands and whenever you are making use of these commands uh, make sure that you retrieve the right information like you know always make sure you use the right column number and uh, you use grep at the grep at the right place okay so now if we go back to our script that we are writing that is node health so let's try to use the same command here as well okay so we'll use everything at one place so that we will understand end of the day what did we learn today perfect so i got this command also here <clears throat> but whenever you are using pipe there is one important thing let's say you are using pipe in your script you have to make sure of using a specific syntax called set minus e o or you will use two commands which is set minus e and set minus o pipe fail now why are these things required 
this is another important topic or these are another best practices that people usually use and we will try to understand why we have to use them as well so what is the purpose of we'll try to understand one by one what is the purpose of purpose of set minus e and what is the purpose of set minus o pi fair if we talk about set minus e what set minus e does is it exits the script so exit the script when there is an error okay so let's say you are writing 100 lines of shell script okay and your shell script got failed in the line number 1 itself but because you have not because you have not using set minus e what happens is all the 100 lines get executed which is not a good practice so let's say uh, you are writing a shell script for this specific order your order is create a user okay then create a file add the username to the file let's say this is the order that you want to follow this is step 1 sorry my bad okay so this is step 1 this is step 2 and this is step 3 so what happens if the step 1 fails and step 2 and step 3 gets executed there is no use right because firstly you want to create a user then you want to create a file only then you want to add the username to the file but if you are writing your shell script without set minus e what happens is the user will not be created for some reason let's say you wrote a wrong command here so this did not get executed so because set minus e is not set in your script this command gets executed this get executed but end of the day for the end user there will not be there will be an empty file and that file will not have any username so what is the point of writing the script at that so if you are not erroring out at the right time what is even a point of writing the script so that's why always make sure you you write set minus e let's say i'm not using this one here we'll see what happens without this one so i'll write one random command here okay ideally this is a wrong command so what should happen your shell script should stop here but let's see what happens dot slash node health dot sh okay your shell script got executed and it gave all the output that is required so any end user what he will think is okay i got all the required information looks like the script is perfect but he will not notice this line let's say this line is printing 1 lakh lines okay so this line gets skipped away and you will under, uh, the user will think okay everything is perfect so what you have to do ideally is every time you write a script make sure your script exits when there is an error so for that reason you just have to say set minus e so these are the best practices but depending upon your organizational requirements you can change them so now see what happened it executed the first line second line then it said okay there is some unknown command here i don't know what is this so i am exiting i am just throwing out an error saying that i know i don't know what this is so i'll not execute the script further isn't this good so always make sure you use this command whenever you are writing the shell script that is set minus e but one of the drawbacks or one of the use cases of set minus e is it will not error out when there is a pipe okay so that's why we have to use this command as well now what do i mean by that i'll show you so let's say this command is not there okay so what is the drawback of set minus e is if somebody does something like this even though this is an error command or this command does not exist if somebody uses a pipe and he will try to say uh, pipe echo so what happens is this script gets executed one more time okay i mean this script gets executed again the drawback here is whenever there is a pipe what set minus e thinks is okay if the last command gets executed i am fine with it let's say there are three commands here and the last command is again an error so let's see what happens okay so it stopped again so what set minus e does without this command is it only looks for the last command in your pipe arguments let's say there are 10 commands here and uh, your fourth command again if you try to add echo here again your script will pass so it will only check the authenticity of your last command or the genuinity of your last command it will not bother about the other commands so that's why whenever you are using set minus e by default use set minus o pipe fail as well because the set minus e will not catch any pipe failures so when you enable this pipe failure then your script will pass so for example now let me do the same thing okay so ideally without pipe fail the script was failing but now let i mean sorry the script was passing now let's see what happens 
what i'm expecting is this script should error out saying that the second or the third line of your script is wrong see it mentioned these things saying that i don't know what this is so that's why set minus o pipe fail is very very important so always when you are using set minus e which exits the script when there is an error you also make sure that you use set minus o pipe fail so this is the purpose of using set minus x set minus e and set minus o pipe fail so some people also do uh, the entire things in the same uh, same command like instead of writing all of these things what people do is they just write it in the same line saying that so they can also write it like this uh, don't confuse if they are writing set minus e x o pi fail okay it is the same command so you can append all of them into a same line as well but never do this at least this is my suggestion because always you should have a flexibility of removing one of these things let's say uh, due to some requirement in my organization i should accept a uh, pipe failure let's say even if there is a pipe failure i want to execute my script so in such cases i can simply comment out this one or let's say i don't want to execute this in the debug mode okay so you can simply comment out this one so there is a easiness to the user right uh like if you remove the uh, minus e or minus x or minus o entirely then the person will not understand so let's say you wrote it in this way set minus e x o pi fail and unfortunately without knowingly some person deleted this one or let's say the person who has knowledge of it deleted this one but the next person who wants to add this new parameter he does not know what it was previously and how to add this set minus o so that's why always try to split them into different uh, lines so that it will be very easy to understand okay so now let's remove this one you understood what is set minus e what is set minus x and what is set minus o right i hope uh, everything is clear uh, because this is not a uh, interactive session so i am hoping uh, if you have any comments like you know uh, you try to put them in the uh, comment section whenever you have any comments and uh, like you already know i am i will uh, definitely reply to all of your command uh, all of your uh, replies and uh, i'll make sure that if there is any doubts which i am not able to explain in this video i'll try to cover them in the comment section post your uh, question in the comments and i'll definitely reply to you uh, from my side okay so now i think this is also clear uh, for the people so we can move to our next topic okay let me close this file here so what i am doing is i am adding all the best practices step by step so that you will not get confused now what is one of the major use case of devops engineers let's say there are 100 applications that are running and uh, if one of the application is failing the first thing that comes to your mind is to look into the log file okay so every time you run into an error there is your one success sutra that is go to the log file find errors in the log file right what people usually do this is the general practice that every devops engineer in every company does is whenever an application is failing they simply go to the log file and they try to find out the errors in the log file now to do that the log files are usually very 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 huge right so for example let's say uh, this is a uh, sample log file uh, let me uh, i think i have a sample log file let me show you uh github i just saved it in my github so this is just a dummy log file uh, for your reference let me open that and show it to you so i stored it in one of my uh, repositories or uh, git repository so this is a dummy log file here if we take this in the raw format so this are this is something uh, how your application log files look like okay so this is huge information and whenever as a devops engineer you want to understand what are the errors in this log file so there are definitely errors here so if you search for error you find out that okay there is error here but you want to do the same same thing in your linux platform this is one of a general use case day to day use cases almost every day people uh, run into errors with their application whether it's their kubernetes pods or whether anything so they usually go to the log files and they try to find out okay what is the error here okay so these are the different uh, log levels there are trace level logging there is info level logging and there is error level logging and my interest is to just find out the error that are uh, the logs that are at the error level but 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 you already know how to do it let's say there is a log file here uh, what you will do is you will use the cat command to print the log file 
and uh, like i just explained you will make use of the grep command to say that grep error so you will use this command and you will get the output now what is there in this so there is a twist here so what happens is whenever these logs get uh, appended like there are more and more of logs so what people usually do is they upload the logs to some storage platforms let's say you uploaded the log to some google storage or uh, you uploaded your log to some amazon storage service like s3 okay or you uploaded the log file to azure blob storage or whatever it is so end of the day you are storing these log files in uh, some of the external storage devices and it is not present on your virtual machine so how do you want to retrieve this information is using the curl command okay so curl is the another command that we are going to learn now okay so what you do is you use the curl command and you can just provide the url of the log file so people will uh, like as a devops engineer you will know where these log files are uploaded so what you can simply do is you can copy the log file location whether it is uh, github or whether it is google storage or s3 bucket whatever it is so just paste the log file and your log file is completely here okay so what curl command does curl command retrieves the information from internet so let's say you want to make a api call uh, if you are coming from a development background you must already know that uh, whenever you try to reach a service you try to reach the service using endpoints so you must be aware of tools like postman right so what postman does postman basically uh, helps you create a api request so similarly if you want to do it in uh, shell scripting you use a command called curl so if somebody is coming from the python background it is something similar to the request uh, module in python okay so this is how you get the required output using the curl command so what i am trying to do is uh, if i get this requirement in my organization so i use the curl command followed by the log file location that is in github and i get all the information now what i'll do is i'll simply say grep error and i got the error logs that's it right so isn't it simple so what made it simple the curl command so using the curl command you can retrieve all of this required information from any external devices from the internet or anything also like i mentioned if you want to make a get request from uh, to google.com or you want to get, uh, make a get request to any of your applications you can also do that using curl command so basically uh, if you want to learn more about it you can simply do man like i explained uh, there is a manual page for every command use the man command and uh, you get all the different parameters <clears throat> like uh, let's say there is a website called or there is an application endpoint called foo.bar.com so what you can do is curl minus x get let's say your request is get so what you can do is curl minus x get followed by you can say uh, api.foo.com okay and if this let's say this does not exist so that's why you did not get any output but if you if you think that uh, foo.com exists so you will get the information that is provided by the api of foo.com so this is how your uh, uh, these days your facebook apis or your google apis or everything works right if you want to automate this in your scripting you make use of the curl command so like i mentioned if somebody is coming from the python background they already know that there is a request module and using the request module you can retrieve information about your uh, apis or from your uh, any of your regular resources you use the curl command so in our case either we can use uh, as a devops engineers either we can use the curl command as an alternative to postman or the request module in python in your shell scripting or uh, if you want to retrieve any information like the log files or uh you want to download any packages also let's say uh you want to download something from the internet like you want to download python even in such cases you can use the curl command make sense so there is one other command called wget okay so wget also uh, solves somewhat similar problem but the problem here is using wget you cannot uh, like for example let, let me uh, share here so i'll copy this log file here and let's say wget okay so what happened the difference is that wget will download this log file okay on the alternative side what happened with the curl command curl command shared the output to you whereas wget command actually stored this information in the log file so now if i do ls i have a log file called dummy log and if i open this log file i'll get the same information okay so here what i need to do in this case is i just use the cat command followed by the grep command to get information about the errors so here we did in two steps that is using wget it stored to a uh, file what is wget wget is basically like a download command so it downloaded 
and then finally I can use the grep command on the downloaded file. But what did curl command do? Curl command directly got the information. So uh, that is the difference. You understood, right? So in curl command, you are able to do it using a single command and using wget, you are able to do it using two different commands. So depending upon your requirement, whatever the command that is required, use the appropriate command. So let's say you don't want to save the output and store it to a file in your local disk. You can directly use the curl command. And uh, if you want to store this information also into a file, you can use the wget command. So that is the difference between wget and curl. So this is your one more interview question. What is the difference between wget and curl? Okay, so now you learned about uh, another two powerful commands that is wget and curl. Now it's time for us to learn about one more command that is, any guesses here? Uh, if somebody is following the flow uh, in which we are going, uh, like you know what we are trying to do is we are trying to learn the commands that are most popular in the DevOps world and uh, what commands that a DevOps engineer use in a day-to-day -day basis. So that is what we are aiming to do. So one more important command that DevOps engineers usually use is the find command. What is find command? Okay. So I'll tell you what is find. Let's say that this Linux system, because this is an AWS Linux system that I just created and uh, it is just with uh, 8 GB disk. It does not have a lot of files. Uh, this is a, a default instance that is provided. So there are very uh, less number of files. Even if we go to the uh, slash etc here, so these are number of files, even because this is a default system, it has some 100 or 200 files in the etc folder. But if you, you, if you go to your uh, virtual machine that you are using in your day to day basis, you might store many such informations like, you know, you mount, you might want to mount new volumes into it and you might use uh, it for storing different log files. So how do you find out files? Let's say I, if I know already that there is a file called dummy log in this specific location, I'll directly go to this specific location and I'll open this dummy log. But let's say I don't know, uh, for example, there is a file in the etc folder here. So this is the file uh, pm.d. But I don't know that there is a file called pm.d in the etc folder. So somebody comes to you and says, Abhishek, uh, there is a file called pm.d. Uh, but I don't know where exactly this file is in this virtual machine. But you have to find out and you have to give that file to me. So in such cases, you can make use of the find command. Okay. So what find command does is it will find using the location that you give. So for example, what I'll do is find slash. What does slash mean? Find everything. So slash means everything, all the files and all the folders in this virtual machine followed by name. And I'll simply say pm.d. I want to uh, execute this as a root user because, uh, you know, Okay, before that, I should explain you how to go to your root user. Probably uh, many people don't know it. So I will just quickly come back. So whenever you are in a Ubuntu user or any user, uh, usually you don't uh, use root user in your organization because root is a very powerful user and you can delete anything. And uh, let's say you delete some important files and folders. They cannot be retrieved back unless you uh, have them in a mounted volume, which has snapshots. So uh, if we case, uh, if we take case of a, uh, take a worst case, uh, using root, you have deleted the file and there is no snapshots or it's not mounted on a volume. What happens is the file is lost forever. So that's why what you do uh, and there are no backups also, obviously, if you have a backup, then you can always retrieve it. So in such cases, what you do is always prefer using your personal user or a service account user that is provided to you. But as a DevOps engineer, most of the times we will have access to the root user. So how do we go to the root user is using this command sudo hyphen, oh, sorry, sudo su hyphen. So this will take you to the root user. Now, what are the different things that we used here? So sudo means substitute user to. So using sudo, you can go to any user. Let's say uh, there is a user on this machine called Abhishek. So using sudo, you can actually go to the Abhishek user or using sudo, you can go to a user called Harsha. So different users, basically just the command is the same, sudo. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, the command is the same, su, that is switch user. So switch user Abhishek, uh, you can go to uh, Abhishek user. Then you can say switch user Harsha, you can go to the uh, Abhish uh, Harsha user. Sorry, my bad, I just uh, talked about the wrong command here. So depending upon uh, which user that you want to do, you can simply use this simple command called switch user and you can go to that specific user. But what I did here is I said sudo su and followed by hyphen so what, is, what are these three commands? 
so first command is switch user and before that we are saying substitute user do so not everybody will be able to go to the root user so that's why we use a command called sudo sudo gives you sudo privileges okay so that means you run some commands on behalf of the root user so let's say that uh, i want to be on the ubuntu user only but only sometimes i want to execute the uh, you know root command like out of 10 times only once i want to go to the root user so in such cases what i'll do is i'll continue to use the ubuntu user but only when i want to execute the root command so before the execution of the command i'll just start with sudo so sudo followed by su that is i want to switch to a different user so that's the command that i used sudo followed by switch user followed by hyphen that is just go to the root user perfect so i'm with the root user <coughs> Okay, so here in this case, what I want to do is I don't want to execute uh, this command as a uh, user called root. So we, if we go back to the find command, what I'll do is find slash minus name pm. Okay, so this is the file that we are trying to find. If I directly do this, I get permission denied on a lot of the folders because as a Ubuntu user, I'm not allowed to go and search of all of those uh, files and folders. So if I just append sudo in front of it, that's it. I'm able to search the entire file system and these are the different files with the name PAM. Okay, so this is how you will use the find command. So find command is a very powerful command. Using the find command, you can search your entire file system, your different files and folders, and you can find out any file that is required. Okay. So these are the things uh, that develop, DevOps engineers usually use. And then you should learn about writing if loops, if else loops, and also for loops. Okay, so these are not not at all difficult. Uh, writing a if loop uh, in uh, you know in shell script is very very simple. L let me show you these three things as well: how to write a if loop, how to write a if else loop, and also how to write a for loop. So it will not take much time. Let us quickly jump and write a shell script and see how to execute the if and else loop. If else, okay. Let me call this as uh, if else example and. Okay, so let me call this as if else, uh, the file name is if else. So you should understand the syntax first. Okay, so if else condition in any programming language, the behavior is the same. It does not depend upon the programming language. Let's say in one of the programming languages, for loop works in a different way, or in other programming languages, for loop work in a different way. No, so if else conditions or for loops always uh, the behavior is the same, but the syntax is different from programming language to programming language. So let's see how to write if else loop in a shell scripting firstly you start with if and then you provide what is the expression that is required okay so what do i mean by expression what is the condition that is required and if the condition is met you will say then what i have to do and let's say you will write something here in the then and you will say that okay these are the different things that i want to execute but but if the condition is not met so go to the else condition and execute these actions finally get out of my if loop this is the thing so in shell scripting uh, it is slightly funny that uh, if starts with if and whenever you want to end your if loop you just uh, write it in reverse saying that fi so it is reverse of if and whenever the executor or the compiler finds if i uh, sorry fi then it understands that okay the if loop is end here so what we'll do is we'll try to replace this one with a real script. So now you understood how to write a if loop, if condition, sorry. Now what I'll say is, let's say, um, let's take one uh, very simple example and say, a is equals to four, and then let us say b is equals to uh, 10. Uh, in shell scripting, there should not be spaces here. So, okay. So let's say a is equals to four and let's say b is equals to 10. We will say that if a is greater than b, say a is the bigger number. If b is greater than a, then say b is the greater number. So for that, the execution is very simple. We can say if followed by the brackets that we just learned, we'll say dollar of a, which is a variable. If dollar of a, oh, what happened? Okay, is greater than dollar of B. 
okay so in such case then you simply say if the condition is met then echo saying that a is greater than b if the condition is not met then using the else statement you can say else echo b is greater than a that's it it is so simple right finally you close the if condition now if you execute this script the uh, script will say that okay a is smaller than b so that's why uh, this condition is not met so i'll say b is greater than a so this is how you write a if condition in shell scripting isn't it so simple yes so uh, once you understand this what you have to do is you have to practice this continuously okay because if you are not practicing the uh, syntaxes what happens is in our day to day uh, life we come across shell script we come across python programs we come across uh, go language uh, uh, program so we usually forget the syntax so what you have to do is to keep yourself updated you have to practice the syntaxes am i clear here perfect so you already learned how to write a if else loop now one more important thing is you have to learn how to write for loops now what is for loop for loop is nothing but let's say you want to execute some action continuously okay or you want to do multiple iterations of an action okay in such cases we use for loops definitely this is common in every programming language but in some programming languages you have while you have uh, you know uh, for loop you have different types of loops so we will only talk about for loop for now because uh, all the other loops depending upon the requirement we use but most of the times we use for loops so let's try to understand what is a for loop and how how and why is it used let's say you are a given a you are given a task and your task is to just uh, let's say your task is to print numbers from 1 to 10 for some random reasons or your task is to print uh, the number of uh, students that are available in a class or your task is to print all the days in a week so in such cases you use a for loop the number of uh, let's say if you if you are asked to print numbers from 1 to 1 lakh will you keep writing all the numbers no so in such cases what we do is we look for automation so the automation that we do here is to write the loops so in shell scripting like every other programming language you have loops like you have a while loop you have for loop you have until loop and uh, you have select loop as well but what we will do is for now we will only learn about the for loop because most of the times we use for loop and the syntax and everything is quite easy uh, one more thing to remember is depending upon the uh, executable to executable let's say you want to use uh, bash scripting you want to use ks it scripting like i said the for loop syntax will slightly vary but most of the people are using bash so that's why uh, your syntax for bash for loop will always remain the same that is something like this for i in you can mention uh, let's say 1 to 100 okay you can simply say for i in 1 to 100 do echo dollar of i followed by done okay so if we split the for loop in three statements what is happening is the first statement is called for so what is the for for is basically the condition so let's say the number is between 1 and 100 then the condition is met and what you are saying after that is do a specific action so if the condition is met do a specific action and once you do that specific action what you have to do is you have to increment okay so what you are asking the compiler is okay so i is equals to 1 the condition is met so what i am asking is print 1 after that before you uh, close the for loop what i'm saying is increment the condition until the number 100 is reached so it will first execute the condition it will perform the action that it, then it will go for the incrementation and finally it will complete the for loop using the done statement that you have provided here so that's how you write a for loop as well okay so the if else conditions for loops these are something that you don't have to worry because you know uh, if you know the logic if you know how to uh, use a if else condition or if you know how to use a for loop you always have resources on the internet so you can make sure that okay if you are doing something wrong in the syntax you can always go back and check but the thing that you have to understand is understand the concept understand the basic how they are used and uh, what is the purpose of using uh, these commands perfect so these are the things uh, that i wanted to talk today we have learnt about uh, how 
uh like you know different scripts that devops engineers use one is the script that we learned that the node automation we have learned about the good practices uh, that we have to use any script and we also looked at uh, if there is a log file huge log file and if you want to filter out the information how do you use that how do we filter out the information using the curl command what is the purpose of wget command so these are the different uh, things that i wanted to teach you finally there is one more command that is the trap command so this is again uh, one of the interview questions but you will use it like probably if you are writing uh, 50 to 100 scripts you might use it once because the trap command is a very tricky command what the trap does okay so trap is basically used to trap okay so the manual page is also not available trap is basically used for trapping signals so what are signals now let me take a couple of minutes to explain you what are signals in linux so whatever action that you are performing you are performing using your keyboard or you are performing using some commands okay let's say you are using a kill command kill command is basically used to kill a process okay so uh, if a java process is running and you want to kill it so what you will say kill minus 9 java so if the name of the process is java or you know the process id let's say the process id is 1111 so you basically use the kill command minus 9 instructs the linux compiler or the linux kernel to say okay kill this uh, specific process with this process id so what is happening behind the scenes is when you are executing this command there is a signal that is passed to the linux saying that okay so this person is asking you to kill a specific file so this is a signal and another thing is let's say Uh, there is a script that is getting executed what we usually do is to terminate the uh, script we use control c okay so when you are pressing control c you are pressing it in, on your keyboard how does a linux machine know that okay when you press control c i have to stop the execution of a script let's say uh, i am printing something like this mm, yes so this is a command and what this command is doing it is continuously uh, in setting something on my terminal okay it is continuously printing if you see there is no end for this no i want to stop the termin I, i want to stop this process or i want to just stop the execution of this process what i can simply do is i can come here and press control c so when i press control c what happened is there is a signal that this terminal has received or there is a signal that this linux machine has received saying that okay so some person has executed control c and i have to start the stop the execution of this process so these are called signals okay in linux there are multiple signals okay what i can do here is uh, let's quickly take a tab because i can't write all of them here so let's see linux signals so these are the list of signals in linux let me take increase the font so if somebody is asking you what are the different signals that are available in linux you can say that there are lot of signals that are there in linux but we usually use some signals like uh, we use the kill command to uh, kill the process so uh, then your linux re receives a signal called sig kill okay so sig uh, kill is a signal so i cannot Uh, basically show you all of these signals because it itself takes a complete class where we uh, go through all of the signal look at the number of signals that linux has okay so these are the different signals but our topic of interest is what is trap command right so that's why i just wanted to explain you one signal so let's say control c is a signal so whenever you are executing a script if somebody presses control c your script execution will stop for example yes is my script it keeps on executing something somebody came here and pressed control c the script execution got stopped which is not intended i don't want somebody to come to my machine and press control c and my script gets uh, stopped so in such cases what you can do is you can trap the signal what is meaning by trap you can trap the linux saying that okay even if somebody is pressing control c understand that i have a trap mechanism that is set on my machine and even if they press control c don't do anything or if they press control c send me a notification saying that on a email notification using smtp server or uh, you know uh, just print an echo statement saying that oh you cannot use the control c because the owner of the linux file uh, the owner of the linux machine said that he does not want to execute control c such things can be used by the trap command okay so trap signal is basically something that traps the signals and performs the execution on your behalf okay so the syntax is again very simple what you can do is you can uh, just uh, just give me a second so you can just say trap followed by whatever you want to execute let's say you just want to say uh, trap echo 
डोंट यूज द कंट्रोल प्लस सी ओके एंड व्हाट इज द सिग्नल दैट यू वांट टू ट्रैप ओके लेट्स से आई वांट टू ट्रैप अ सिग्नल कॉल्ड एस आई जी इंटरप्ट okay so if somebody is interrupting using control c what i want to do is i want to send them this output okay so i want to just say them that echo don't use the control c so basically you are saying that the control c should not work so you are trapping this entire mechanism that's why we call it trap i hope you understood this and uh, you know because there are a lot of signals that are available in linux uh, practically i cannot uh, go through each and every signal but the theoretically you should understand that using trap command you can trap any signals that are available on your linux machine sometimes what happens is uh, if we want to uh, take a look at a real time scenario if somebody is executing a script and uh, you are using control c and uh, the half of the information is uh, let's say there is a database and your shell script is trying to populate the list of users into your database okay and what happened is somebody came uh, uh, came to your uh, terminal and they just use control c or unfortunately you use control c now what happens is only the half of the information is populated and the database uh, user thinks that okay some information is there and this is the information i can start using so instead what you want to do is whenever somebody prints control c you say that delete every content so in such cases what you say is trap whenever somebody is using uh, sig int that is the control c what you have to do is rm minus rf star so if somebody is using control c delete everything from the database so that end user will not think okay uh, some information is populated so i can start working this is the advantage of using a trap signal so i hope you have enjoyed the first two parts of this video tutorial now it's time for interview questions and also time for validating your knowledge on the concepts that you have learned in part 1 and part 2 okay so without wasting any time so today i'm here with some 20 questions and these 20 questions i have gathered from various sources and from my past experiences and trust me these are the most commonly asked questions so whenever you are going for a shell scripting interview so you can definitely expect few questions from this and uh, we'll try to understand these questions as detail as possible so the first question there is a reason why i put this question as a first one so whenever you are doing a shell scripting interview what happens is the interviewer always tries to understand what do you know about shell scripting or what is your common understanding or uh, do you use it in a day to day basis or not so whenever somebody asks you this question list some most commonly used shell commands so the first thing that you have to do is be very honest and tell what are the commands that you use day to day basis like you know what are the commands people regularly use is the ls command to list the files people use some commands like uh, you know the copy command the move command people use uh, mkdir to create directories or touch command to create files vim vim command to open the files grep to filter the commands so only talk about these commands the reason why i'm saying is i have seen people answering uh, something like okay uh, on a day to day basis i use netcat or use commands like route uh, i use commands like trace route but trust me these are the commands which you use only when you are into issues right only when you want to debug something so firstly start with the commands and be honest and explain that okay i use shell scripting for listing the files and uh, for that i use the ls command uh, usually uh, we have to uh, find some files on a uh, linux machine so for that we use the find command and uh, you know you can say that we usually debug the linux machine so we use some uh, debugging commands like top command or sar command or uh, you can say that uh, we uh, look for the disk spaces so we use the df command so you tell about the commands that you use regularly because most of the times all the companies uh, employees use these common commands and uh, the commands like trace root or the commands like netcat are only used when there are issues or when you have to debug machine so say that these are the commands that i frequently use and there are some additional commands like whatever the advanced commands that you want to mention okay so this is about the question number 1 and then the question number 2 that we have is write a simple shell script to list all the process so this is a very easy command and uh, you know this is something that people use day to day basis so the purpose of asking this question is do you really use your 
day to day or you know do you regularly work on a linux machine or not so to identify the list of processes if you watched our previous videos you can simply do ps hyphen ef so ps hyphen ef will list all the processes and it will also provide information of all the processes like you know uh, there is a go process that is running on my machine there is a zsh process that is running on my machine there is bash process of course running on my machine so these are the things and you know once you explain about this command like ps hyphen ef they might ask you okay so ps hyphen ef is giving a lot of things i just want the uh, process id which is like you know this one so just print me the process id so for that uh, in our previous videos i explained you like just take example of one command here or the one output here so let's say that this is uh, one of the process that is running and this is the entire information of the process right so when they are asking you to only print the process id you need to understand that you know this is a line and this line has 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 strings and they are specifically asking you to print the second string or column number 2 so what do we have to do i also explained this in the previous video but you can make sure i mean you can use the awk command awk is basically used to uh, filter the output of a specific uh, line or a specific uh, file or whatever you want to so i can use awk and i can say the field separator what is the field separator in this case i mean who is, what is separating a string from a string that is a white space so simply within the double quote use a space okay followed by use a dollar and uh, sorry use a single quote and uh, inside the brackets just say print what is the column that you want to print column number 2 so it will directly print you all the process ids so that's it it's a simple question and this question can be extended uh, just like what i have shown you after that write a script to print only errors from a remote log so this is again something uh, that is really important because let's say all your logs are getting stored in a uh, google storage or let's say all your logs are getting stored in an s3 bucket so you can get the entire log using the api call or you can use a how do you use uh, how do you retrieve logs or how do you retrieve any information uh, from a remote server or a remote machine in shell script using the curl command so we already discussed about the curl so using curl what you can do is you can get the entire output of the file but the thing that you have to do is instead of getting the entire output they are asking you only to print the error message so for that what you can do is like i have also shown you previously you can simply say uh, let's say i have a remote file uh, for example curl google.com so this is just an example okay so when i say curl google.com this is the output that i got now let's say they only want me to print the this specific line okay or they just want me to print href okay href h reference okay so what i need to do is after the curl command i can simply use a pipe followed by the grep command to print the specific line that i want let's say in this case assume this is an error message line so what you can say is simply grep href and what happens is you get that file only ignore about this this part uh, this thing here okay so just ignore this one this is just the output that we are receiving but this is how you retrieve a specific line or specific set of lines from the remote machine whether it is a log file whether it is any other file this is how you retrieve it and for your example uh, if you want me to show a specific log file also i just uploaded a log file the other day uh, on to one of my git repositories you can also use this one for your practice so this is a sandbox repository that i have and uh, so this is the dummy log file that i stored so just click on this log file so here you can see a log file right so this is just a dummy log file that i just stored uh, for our students example purpose so here if you see there is info log there is tracing log and even in your real time use case this will be how i mean this is how your log file looks like so let's say i just want to print the trace logs okay so there are lot of info log info logs but i only want to read the trace logs so instead of going through the file and reading this 100000 lines of file what i can simply do is i can say curl followed by just get the url of the file and followed by grep trace because we want to get the trace file and here we have all the trace file what you can now do is you can simply copy this into a file and you can share this output to your colleagues or whoever is requesting this information now in an interview what you will say i can simply get this output using the combination of curl what are the three different commands you are using here you are using curl just go back to the command 
we are using the grep and also we are using the pipe so that's why we will say you can achieve this by using curl pipe and grip okay there is a significance for each and every command here so what is curl doing curl is retrieving the output or curl is getting your entire log file what is grep doing grep is only getting a section of output that you want like if you want error then it is only getting error but what is pipe doing pipe is combining this command with this command okay so let's say that there is no pipe here okay so if there is no pipe what happens is you you are getting you are getting the log file here and you are using the grep command but without pipe there is no use see what happened it sent you the entire file not just the trace and after that it said could not resolve the host grep and could not resolve the host trace that means it is not understanding the next command that you entered so the grep trace is something that it is not understanding so for the compiler to understand you have to use the pipe command and what pipe does is it will send the output of your entire first command to the second command okay that's how you retrieve only the trace level logs or if you want to just get the error you can just change it to error perfect so this is how it works we got all the error logs here so isn't it very easy so just you need to practice these commands after that write a shell script to print numbers divided by 3 and 5 and not 15 okay so for your purpose what i have done is i have slightly complicated this question so there are many forms of this question like people might ask you like an interview can ask you interviewer can ask you print even numbers okay or they can say print odd numbers print numbers divisible by 3 or people can ask you print prime numbers so all of them are same category questions okay don't worry like the only reason why i have these questions or uh, you know i just combine this question so that you understand everything like i don't want to just say uh, print even numbers or print odd numbers or print divisible by 3 so instead i just combined multiple questions and i framed a single question so that we save time some we save some time as well so the approach is same let's say you have to print even numbers what you will do you will check if the number is divisible by 2 for odd numbers you will just say not divisible by 2 that's it right so you just need to understand the approach okay and similarly here if you try to understand the question let's break the question into multiple parts and finally we will try to put this script i mean this we'll try to put this entire thing into a shell script okay we'll write that as well so firstly what is the question so the question is divided into three parts divisible by 3 divisible by 5 and not divisible by 15 okay so there are three parts the first part is the number has to be divisible by 3 the second part is number has to be divisible by 5 and the final part is number should not be divisible by 15 no why did i choose this one then let's try to understand the question so what is the multiple and multiple of 3 and 5 let's say uh, you have you are given numbers from uh, 1 to 15 okay so what are the numbers that are divisible by 3 you have 3 you have 6 you have 9 you have 12 and you have 15 and similarly for 5 what will be the uh, numbers the numbers will be 5 10 and 15 so what my question is trying to do is print me these numbers print me these numbers but just exclude 15 okay so this is slightly tricky but we will be able to achieve it in a simple way i'll show you how to achieve it and let's also learn how to write this kind of scripts in a step by step manner now you will ask interviewer immediately the question write a shell script to print numbers divided by 3 and 5 so we'll ask you uh, i mean you will ask the interviewer from how many for how, for how much range do you want me to print like uh, do you want me to print for the numbers between 1 and 100 or 1 and 1000 or do you want me to uh, create a custom range of numbers so let's say interviewer said okay print numbers divided by 3 and 5 and not divisible by 15 from 1 to 100 okay so now let's take this into a shell script so let me call sample script dot sh okay so firstly what we will always do is we will use a shebang and we'll say slash bin slash bash after that what we will do we'll provide the information of the script right now i am not doing to just save the time so for you what you can do is you can put all the details of your script that you are writing here who is the author what is the information what is the script what is it trying to do just provide all this information after that okay i'm skipping that part 
what you will try to do is you will try to break down the question as i just explained you because whenever you are writing a script in the in an interview interviewer has to understand your mind right you just can't simply start writing the code but just explain him while writing what you will say is okay i understood your question and my approach would be the number has to be divisible by divisible by 3 divisible by 5 and you will explain him that it should not be divisible by 3 times of 5 that is 15 okay so that's what you will explain him that means in my script what i'll do is i'll make sure the number is divided by 15 oh sorry divided by 3 divided by 5 and not divided by 15 so this will be my logic now after this what you will do is you'll start writing the script so first of all to write the script you got an input from the interviewer that the number range has to be 1 to 100 but instead of writing the entire thing in a single command what you will do is you'll break down so firstly let's write the if command okay because what we have identified is firstly the number has to be divided by 3 this is a condition right what is this this is a if condition and again this is another if condition right we have two if conditions here and finally we have one not if condition and we have a for loop because the range is already explain so the interviewer told you the range is 1 to 100 so we can use a for loop perfect so you have this information as well so firstly let's start with the if if what you will say inside the square brackets what you want to do is you want to say that the expression okay so expression percentile let's say the number is i okay i should be divided by 2 or it should be the percentage of this number should be equals to 0 okay so that's why what you will mention is if expression of i percentile percentile sorry i percentile 2 equals to equals to 0 okay in such case you will simply say that then echo dollar of i perfect and finally you will close the if block uh, sorry my bad here you should say if i percentile percentile 3 okay because our first condition is to verify if the number is divided by 3 or not um, are you clear with this now let's extend this one okay what is our second condition divisible by 5 so what you have to do is just put a or condition and just copy the entire thing here just paste it and instead of 3 replace it with 5 okay now you have complicated the condition and you said the number has to be divisible by 3 divisible by 5 and if this condition is matching if one of these condition is matching because we are using the or condition what happens if you are using and condition both the both this condition i mean both this expression and this expression have to be true but because it can be 3 or it can be 5 divisible by 3 or divisible by 5 we will use a or condition here perfect now we did this as well but we are left with one final condition that is the number has to be not divisible by 15 okay so for that reason what you will say is ampersand ampersand let's copy the same condition okay and here what i'll say is percentile 15 not equals to 0 okay so this condition has one or condition and one and condition okay so the number has should I mean, the number should always be not divisible by fifteen, but it can be divisible. Uh, it can be divisible by three, and it can be, or it can be divisible by five. Okay, so that is the condition here, right? It can either be a multiple of three, it can either be a multiple of five, but it should not be a multiple of fifteen in both the cases. So that's why I use the and condition here, and for this one, I use the or condition. Perfect. Now you wrote the script, but who will define the range? So for that, what we need to do is. above this you have to define a range how do you define a range using a for loop say for i in okay 1 to 100 do this is the condition that you are doing and finally you will say done because your condition is done so inside the for loop this is the conditions that you are applying so that's why this is your for loop statement this is the condition and finally you are closing your for loop so this will be your script now let's save this one let us say ch mode 777 like i always say in your real time do not use 777 use only the uh, parameter or uh, the permission that is required okay now let's me try to execute this one 
sample script.sh and what will happen it will return uh, if you see here let's see from the starting 3 is available 5 is available 6 is available because this is uh, divisible by 3 divisible by 5 again 3 again 3 5 12 is there but there is no 15 the reason is we have skipped the 15 or we have skipped the multiples of 15 even if you see here 90 number 90 is not available 87 and 93 are available right so that's the condition that we have executed if we look at the script one more time we say the script or the numbers should be multiples of 3 multiples of 5 but it should not be multiple of 15 okay now because you understood how do you how do you write these scripts what you can do is you can try by yourself for even numbers odd numbers you can also try for multiple of uh, 6 multiple of 7 whatever you want you can just improve the script and you can try it at your end perfect after that write a script to print number of s in mississippi okay there is no uh, reason why i choose mississippi mississippi is slightly a complicated word and uh, most of the times people use uh, this word itself in most of the interviews also i have seen so you can change it with anything you can say singapore okay or you can choose any word you can choose your name and you can try to print one of the alphabet occurrence so the script what it is trying to say is the number of occurrence of s in mississippi so if you see here there is two there are two s here and there is one more s here and one more s here so the output should output should be four and what if the interviewer is giving the word called singapore the output output should be one because there is only one s i hope you understood the question and now let's try to write this script as well vim let me call this as number dot sh okay so the script is again very simple don't worry about the thing uh, we'll start with, as always, we'll start with shebang, slash bin, slash bash. Now, there are multiple ways to do this thing. Uh, like always, whenever you're doing a scripting, people do it in their own ways. People try to be very creative. But in an interview, always start with the basics. Okay. So the interviewer should not feel that you don't know the basic way of doing it or you don't know the, uh, like, you know, uh, the easy way of doing it. So always say that this is the easy way of doing it. And if you want, I can in improve the efficiency or you can say that I can do it in a much better way. But if you ask me, uh, like this is a very simple command to achieve this one because you are not doing any programming, right? You are just doing a command here. Let's say you are doing a programming, then I agree that, you know, your time complexity will come into picture and all of the other things. But because you are just doing or just you are talking about a simple shell command. So that's why I say that, okay, whenever you ask me this one, I can simply uh, do the grep command and find it. But if you want, I can also, uh, you know, use some advanced approach or you use an efficient way of doing it. So the output here is very simple. Firstly, define the word. Let's call this as X and let's say X is equals to M I S S I S S I P I. I hope the spelling is right. Uh, so how you will achieve this is just say grep and in grep, there is a command called minus O or hyphen O, which will stand for only. Okay. What you are trying to grep, you are only trying to get for an alphabet called S. Even if it is Singapore or even if it is Mississippi, you are only trying to grep for an alphabet called S followed by three lesser than symbols, which I, which we'll talk now. Dollar of X, X, X is nothing but Mississippi that you defined here. And finally, you will say word count minus L. What this command is doing is it is sending all the four S to this one. And in here, what we are doing is we are trying to count the words. Okay. So word count command is nothing but let's say uh, you have a file and somebody asks you that what is the length of this file or how many number of lines are present in this file. So in such cases, you can simply use the word count command and say that, okay, uh, cat name of the file pipe word count minus L. So word count minus L is always used to return the number of lines. So here what we are doing is we are trying to redirect the output of this into a standard input and this standard input is passed to the grip command. Okay. So on a first sight, you might find it complicated, but this is very, very easy. We are just using the grip command to only filter or, you know, only uh, get the output of single alphabet that is S and we are trying to send this uh, Mississippi into a standard input to this command. And finally, we are trying to get the word count. Okay. So what you need to do here is you have to practice these things. Okay. Only with practice, you can achieve these kind of things. Pause this video here. Try to understand what I've done. And finally, you will, uh, you know, master this art. So the output is four. If you change uh, the name here, let's say I'll change this to Singapore. 
okay so if i change this to singapore what will happen the output should be one because there is only one s here that's it so this is so simple uh, only thing is you have to just master it every day okay how will you debug the shell script nothing uh, the command is very simple whenever you start writing your shell script what you need to do is you have to do set minus x that is set minus x so for any script if you just add your first line as set minus x then your shell script will run in debug mode or you can able to troubleshoot your shell script you we already saw that on our previous videos what is cron tab in linux can you provide an example usage okay so basically cron tab is nothing but uh, let's say you are a linux administrator okay so you are a linux admin so as a linux admin your job your roles and responsibilities are every day at 6 pm you have to send a report okay what report you have to send let's say you have to send the report of node health how your node is performing or uh, what is the cpu usage what is the ram usage instead of every day you go and log in at 6 pm and execute a specific script what you can do is you can make use of cron tab cron tab is nothing but it's like an alarm or it's like uh, you know every day you just set your cron tab to 6 pm and linux will automatically execute your script at 6 pm and give you the output whether you want to store it in s3 bucket or you want to store in a specific folder of a file you can do that using cron tab that's it so the question is very simple and the answer is also very simple do not try to complicate such kind of questions now how do you open a file in a readme mode so uh, read only mode okay so usually how do you open a file you use vim command or you use a vm command so how do you how do you use it like you say vim test dot txt or vim test dot sh or something right so instead what you can do is you can just say hyphen r so that the file will be just opened in the read me mode or read only mode sorry not read me read only what is the difference between soft and hard link okay so this is one of the most asked questions so just pay attention to what i'm saying this is not complicated but you have to understand this uh, so that you explain this in a better way to the interviewer so in linux there are two links one is soft link and one is hard link so what are these links so let's say uh, what happens when you create a file okay let's say that uh, you create a file or you just say, try to save a file okay create a file and save a file what happens in this case whenever you create a file and save a file this gets saved in the memory right where is get where is this getting saved this is getting saved in a memory or on the disk so what happens is let's say you want to reuse this file multiple times okay you want to create a copy of this file okay or you want to just uh, uh, i mean take a copy of this file and modify this file in such cases you can use hard links okay so instead of copying this command all the time using cp command or you know uh, just copying the content of the file into a different command you can just create a hard link to this specific file uh, i'm not uh, explaining you about the uh, syntax of this hard link it is nothing but you can simply use the ln command that's not uh, complicated but you need to understand the concept here so using hard link what you can do is you can create copy or you can mirror a specific file okay so what happens here is even if your original file gets deleted let's say you have a secret file and your secret file should not be deleted because you have some sensitive information what you can do is you can create a hard link of the file what happens is it will create a copy hard link will create a copy so even if the actual file is deleted from the memory your copy still exists and your hard link will keep a backup of your file but soft links are not like that the best example for soft link is let's say you have python 3 installed on your machine okay so you will always see there is a python 3 file and there is always there is also a python file what this python does is whenever you are executing dot slash python okay so your linux terminal will send this output to python 3 because the python has a soft link to python 3 that's it so what is the difference between hard link and soft link if you are deleting python 3 or if you are deleting python because both of them are referencing to the same point in the memory both the files are deleted okay so soft links are like that why you use soft links is basically for this kind of things like creating alias files or uh, instead of every time you type python 3 you can create an uh, soft link for python 3 called python and you can just say okay use python so these kind of things this is just an example so always explain your interviews in terms of examples then what is the difference between break and continue statements in a loop again this is uh, quite commonly asked questions break continue okay so the words itself will explain you the answer 
I don't have to explain it completely because the words are self-informative. What is break? Break is nothing but you are breaking the execution. Continue is nothing but, okay, you are continuing the execution. Okay. So the thing is, the continue comes with a special condition called skip. So it is, instead of continue, you have to understand it as skip this and continue the next okay so it is very simple let's say you are doing a for loop okay and in the for loop we'll take the same example that we discussed okay the number has to be divided by three the number has to be divided by five but if the number is divided by three and five that is if it is a multiple of three and five that is 15 you have to ignore okay so what you can do in the for loop is instead of the way that we wrote previously you can say okay has to be divided by three perfect has to be divided by five but if it is divided by 15 just ignore so instead of ignore what you will say is just continue the iteration similarly break is nothing but break you use when uh, let's say you have a complicated for loop and this for loop is executing between numbers one to one crore okay or just let's assume n number of zeros okay so this script takes almost 10 minutes to execute but what your interviewer says that if I am finding a number in between, okay, so I just want five, okay, so the my output is five, but I want you, I want you to loop through one to this number, or my output is five, 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 but I want you to loop through the entire loop or find until this number is found, okay. So for that cases, what you will do is you will start looping from one to this large number, but whenever you find this number, you can simply say break, okay. Another example is, let's say you have hundred students in your class. Okay, and you have a record of this 100 students. Okay, let's say that you stored all of these 100 students in a CSV file or an Excel sheet. Okay, so in such cases, what you will usually do is you loop through all the student names and you will print all the student names. But what your interviewer says is, once you find a student name called Abhishek, okay, stop the execution. That's all I want. Okay, whenever Abhishek is found, I don't want all the people after Abhishek. Okay, so my criteria is, just find all the students. If Abhishek is in the first place, just print the output as Abhishek. If Abhishek is in the third place, just print student number one, student number two, and Abhishek. If Abhishek is in 10th position, just say student one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and Abhishek. So in such cases, you can simply use the continue state, oh, sorry, the break statement. I hope this is clear to you. Now let's go to the next question. Okay, so this is a tricky question. People will ask you, what are the disadvantages of shell scripting? I think people will ask you everywhere whenever you are giving any interview like Java interview or Python interview. So come up with your own answer. I have shared some information here. Don't go with this one. Try to explain your real-time use cases whenever you are writing shell script. What are the disadvantages that you found? Like you can say one of the example as it's not statically typed. That is, uh, you know, uh, you can just declare a variable. And uh, even if you are not using it, like let's say if you are, uh, not defining set minus u. Okay. Uh, the person has not used this set minus u command in his script. And uh, what happens is, even though there are n number of undeclared variables, your shell script will not complain. Your compiler will not complain. So you can explain such kind of use cases, which are very practical in nature. What are different kinds of loops and when to use? I think you already know you have for loop, you have while loop, you have do while loop. Okay. So you can just say that okay there are different types of uh, uh, loops in uh, shell scripting and these are the different kinds of loops like any programming language uh, what is the purpose of each and every loop so i'm just leaving it to you to identify what are the different types of loops and uh, you know what is the use case for each and every loop the reason why i'm leaving this to you is because this is a very common question that you will find a lot of sources in the interview and uh, we should not waste time on such kind of questions is bash dynamically or statically typed? Okay, so this is uh, one more question. So the modern day programming languages are usually uh, statically typed. Like if you take uh, Golang or these kind of things, they are statically typed. But if you look at the programming languages like Python, okay, or Shell, so these are the scripting language like Shell, they are dynamically typed. What do I mean by dynamically typed? Let's say I'm using Shell scripting. So I can simply do like this, right? X is equals to five, or I can say X is equals to string or I can do any other thing. But if you are talking about a specific programming language like Go language, before you have to define like where X is a string. Okay. And if you are providing X with a number, your uh, Go language will say that, okay, the Golang interpreter will say that, okay, you said X is a string, but you have provided integer. So I'll terminate the execution or throw you an error. 
so the same thing does not apply you can do it with shell as well or python as well but by default the nature is a dynamically typed okay uh, people will ask you what are the networking uh, troubleshooting tools that you use so one of the best tool that i'll recommend here is trace root okay so trace root is a tool that you can use for your uh, uh, network debugging for example i'll show you uh, you want to see why your network is slow usually you will go to your internet and you will find some networking tools and you will try to understand why is it slow but the classic way of doing uh, even these modern day tools also use uh, these kind of uh, shell commands or the linux commands underneath so to understand why your network is very slow today what you can do is you can simply say trace route or trace root followed by google.com so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to reach the google.com let us see what are the number of hops in between your trace route and google.com that is from your laptop it goes to your router from your router it goes to your internet service provider router from there it will take multiple hops and finally reach google.com so this command will explain you what are the different hops and how much each hop is taking time okay so these kind of things you can identify using trace route so firstly it said okay this is your ip address this is my ip address and let's see where is it going after that it will basically uh, go to a specific act corporation that i'm using okay after that it goes to a different ip address i cannot uh, show you the entire details but after i mean uh, for the purpose of security after that it goes to your internet service provider and finally it will reach your google.com and similarly there is one more command called trace path so trace path is also efficient command because using trace path also you can identify okay trace path is not installed on my machine but using trace path also you can identify these things and trace path does not require root privileges and after that how will sort list of names in a file so this is not a not at all a complicated question sometimes i have seen interviewers asking this uh, silly questions because people uh, think a lot about these things and uh, you know they start writing a sort uh, sort kind of looping and all the other things but as i already mentioned you whenever you are doing or whenever you are explaining your interviewer always talk about the easiest way and then you can say okay so sort comes with the nature of uh, time complexity uh, o of n or o of n square whatever it is and you can say that okay i can improve the efficiency but first of all the easy way of doing is use the sort command so linux natively has a command called sort how will you manage logs of a system that generates huge log files every day this is very very important question for linux administrators and uh, also devops engineers because as a linux admin you manage lot of applications right so each of these applications will definitely omit logs and if your application is a real time uh, front end facing application i mean real time customer facing application so it will emit 100 1000 1000 n number of logs right so how do you preserve all of these logs so if you keep storage of all these logs then what happens your disk gets on increasing and increasing so for that reason there is an efficient way on linux that is called log rotate okay so using log rotate you can basically efficiently manage your linux machines logs or application logs so about the log rotate command the command is very simple uh, you can just say log rotate and uh, you can define like for how many days you want to load, rotate these logs let's say uh, for every day once end of your 24 hours you can say that once uh, 24 hours is done just zip this log you can also define the format like you can say gzip or you can say zip or you can say tar create a compressed version of this zip file and say that okay after 30 days if the 30 days has happened just delete the log file okay so these are all the uh, commands and these are all some of the most common interview questions that i wanted to explain today if you have any questions don't hesitate uh, post the questions in your in the comment section uh, as you know i reply to each and every comment uh, that i receive on my video and finally don't forget to like subscribe my channel share this video with your friends and we'll do lot more interesting uh, concepts on the shell scripting and also on python in the coming days thank you so much i hope you like the video i'll see you in the next video bye take care